back to Arrakis, ladies and gentlemen, and I've got a panel of gentlemen that's going to be discussing this movie with me. I got uh, Scott. How you doing, buddy? Hello. Scott's, Scott's always there. I got my good man, Brian, from the KO Show, friend in real life, friend of the show, same with Scott and same with Matt. And welcome back, Matt. Special yeah. guest. Um, was on the show for uh, what, eight fucking years and then uh, <laughs> parted ways, but wanted to come back for Dune. So here we are. Welcome you back, sir. It's good to see you. Glad to see everything's going well for you out there in Portland, Oregon. But uh, I don't know about you guys. I've been, uh, I've had this date circled. I've been uh, thinking about this, this movie a lot after seeing it and um, going through a battery of different emotions reflecting upon the movie. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion. There's four of us, so there's going to be a lot of things that have to be said going around. We'll, we'll try not to do interruptions. We're literally all in different locations. But um, I think we're going to kind of handle this more of like a round table. Let's just talk about Dune. If we talk about some of the first movie, any of the books, the expanded universe, we want to talk about. But I obviously want to, a lot of the main thrust we want to be this film and, um, and the impact it had on us, if any. And, uh, and that's it. That's my high level introduction to the discussion that's going to take place today for Dune 2. Uh, we have um, a, quite a few listener comments that are very lengthy. I think with four hosts, um, we're probably going to have a lengthy discussion. I will attempt to get to some of these comments. Some of them are really long, and for me to just sit here and read a piece of paper, to be frank, is not great content. But there is really good stuff in here from our listeners. So thank you, guys. Um, I just want to shout out Hannibal RX, Ventriloquist, Bex. These are people who commented either on Facebook or on Discord. I got Matthew Lewis, Zola Bali, of course, of the Midnight Double Feature. Great host, good dude. Luke Ormsby, Mikey Angelari. We got Ryan Tierney. And uh, yeah, those are the ones that kind of we selected to stick in here. So if I don't read those guys in toto, <laughs> I just want to say thanks for your participation. But um, there's a lot of good thoughts in there. I particularly find myself gravitating towards a lot of what Hannibal was sharing. But anyway, guys, we've all seen Dune. We've probably all seen it twice at this point. And um, I just kind of want to go around the room and get like that top down, high level camera pulled back. How do you feel? What do you think? You've saw it. You felt the way when you walked out of the theater. You've thought about it a little bit more. Just, just kind of that, like a free associate. And uh, and I say, uh, I think I'm gonna go. I think I'm gonna go. Scott, Ryan, Matt. How's that sound? Nice. All right. Yeah. Sounds well, good. Hit me, Scotty. Uh, you know, it's been a long time since I saw a movie that lived up to my expectations, and. And, and I keep my expectations nowadays in movies very low because, let's <laughs> yeah. be honest, it's very, very rough out there for movies. It's not very, I don't think there's a lot of real movies being made. I mean, and real, I mean, actually like a labor of love, people who are into what they're, they're filming. It just seems people are just doing their job and putting out movies to make people uh, go to the movie theater and see a movie and make, make money on it. Keep I feel like this up. was a, yeah, exactly. I feel like this was a labor of love and I feel like the movie left me w wanting and hoping that they do it a, a part three, that I see more of this. They uh, are. Oh, really? Okay. Yep. Cause I didn't, I wasn't sure. Uh, I would tell you right now that I was very surprised um, in, in many aspects we'll get into in the, in this pod, but I was surprised at the growth between uh part one and part two i think they learned a lot from the first movie on how to make the second movie better mm. uh there's so much to get into but i think it's amazing uh, i came awesome. out of the movie theater actually excited that a movie a, a movie or a franchise or a book even that i love was done properly Good you know shit. i felt like for the first time in a while this wasn't just a cash grab this was something you know and and, and 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 Dune is not something easily translated to film. It's not. Um, Indeed, it, it's something that's really hard to to narrow down. And I think they did it. I, I'm excited to sit down with you guys and talk to. It. I want to hear what you guys say uh, because I love this movie. Honestly, awesome. Scott loves it. Brian, hit me. <clears throat> uh, so I've kind of gone through three phases of my opinion <laughs> of this movie. Um, 
when I, I saw it with Brian and my lovely wife, wife Maja in the theater, by the way, we, uh, we went, the three of us went together in a very <laughs> fancy movie theater where they serve you food and drinks and this fucked up for the record. <laughs> and whatever. Fucked up. we missed the first 10 minutes of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah. um, Villeneuve, he's, he's on a short list of directors for me that are appointment viewing. And, and I essentially enjoy every movie that he makes. Um, you know, Alex Garland, N Nolan, Villeneuve, these are people who I'm going to see whatever movie they put out there. And usually I enjoy them. Um, when I walked out of the movie theater, I was blown away. Because I think that it's visually stunning. The sound design is amazing. The, the acting is pretty good. Whether or not it's true to the characters, we'll get into that. But I think that uh, overall, the production value of that movie is... 10 out of 10. It's amazing. He's, he's, he's a great director. Um, when I sat back and started analyzing certain departures from the source material, I started getting a little bit shitty about it <laughs> and being a little like, squirrely. Yeah. Like what, like why the fuck did they do it that way? Or, or <clears throat> like, why did they leave that out? That was super interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and now I've in, in doing a little bit of research and getting a second and a third watch under my belt. Um, I've kind of met in the middle where I think that there's misses when it comes to uh, the script and the storytelling. But like I said, the production value of the movie is so good that, that I highly rewatchable. Um, I really liked it. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Really liked Scott loves. Um, and now before I, before I let Matt take over here, I just want to say that Matthew and I actually did a podcast called mind killer. Um, a Dune podcast. <laughs> And uh, we actually cover the entire book. Uh, we do like three to five chapters per episode. And um, I think it ended up being 13 to 14 episodes, somewhere in that neighborhood. It is a long time to do, um, but we did it. And it's interesting because I'm trying to go back. I actually listened to some of that almost as preparation for this episode, which is kind of oddly masturbatory um, <laughs> because I was trying to remember, you know, there's so much, there's so much, uh, I think so Scott much. said, not easily translated, 100% not easily translated. So there is a ton here, and, and I do not behoove the difficulties that will fall upon a director to make such a picture. Um, and, and I'm with you, Brian. The production value is, is easily uh, incredible, 100%. But, Matthew, please, like the, like the gentleman before you, high-level, top-down, camera pulled back. Yeah. And Definitely. welcome back. No, I mean, I hope, I hope oh, uh, yeah. it's good to see you. No, it's good to be back. I've been looking forward to this. I've been really excited to talk with you guys about this, honestly. Um, but yeah, no, I'm to be honest, <clears throat> I'm gonna echo Scotty and Brian both because I really like this movie. Um, I think it's damn good. Um, and to be honest, on my first viewing, I've seen it twice now, twice in theaters. Um, mm -hmm. on my first viewing, I, I came out of it really enjoying it, really liking it, pretty high on it. Um, but if you had asked me at that moment, which do you prefer Doom part one or part two, I probably would have still said part one. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I, and I could get into that some on the episode that we, as we go, um, forward. Um, but cause I really like part one and I think part one is a more, I don't know how to say it, slightly more faithful to the book in a sense of like really following what the book is doing. And part two gets a little looser with it. But on second viewing of part two, I actually think it's a damn fine example of an adaptation, of an adaptation of a book to film. Um, because, you know, one of the things, and I don't want to speak too much on this, I'm sure we'll get into it, but um, one of the things I thought the movie did so, so well was isolating kind of one of the main through lines of the book and then and emphasizing it and bringing it to the forefront of the story and making it more making the movie more about one driving force, which to be honest, when I think about if, if, it, if it were my job to write the Dune script to adapt the book, that's kind of what I would want to try and do because there are just, there are literally, if you're, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to capture every line of dialogue and every bit, every scene of the book, you need an eight hour mini series. Like there's just no avoiding it. Like it, it would, it would take too much you want to make a feature film, a two and a half, three hour feature film uh, surrounding the final half of the Dune book. 
this is kind of how you do it. Like you pick, you pick your, your through line, your, you know, your main story that you're going to focus on and you emphasize that, um, you, you can't bring in every element of the book. It, it's just going to get too muddy, too lost, too confusing. Um, and I think the movie did an excellent job <clears throat> of honing in on Paul and the Fremen as well as the, the Bene Gesserit Missionaria Protectiva. Um, it brought all of that to the forefront, and I thought it did that super, super well. And that's the stuff that I really can't wait to talk about. Um, and then, you know, like you guys said, the production design of this movie, the look of this movie is just phenomenal. Like, I don't know how, if anybody's disappointed on that front, I'm like, what the fuck do you want? <laughs> Like it's, it's pretty fucking amazing. Like it looks incredible. The CG looks real. Um, it just looks fantastic. So yeah, honestly, I'm pretty high on this movie. I can't wait to, to get it more into it with you guys. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I have a similar trajectory to Brian, um, in that I left kind of feeling, um, like the spectacle sort of captured me in the moment. Um, in the spectacle, I think for me, I think for me, one of the struggles I, I might have with this movie, I think I'm lower on it than all of you, if I'm being honest. And I think one of the struggles I have with, with Dune is that uh, I think I left the movie not feeling particularly emotionally, uh, not feeling super emotionally charged from it outside of superficial things like i really enjoyed these moments of combat where these machine guns opened up i, I remember looking over brian going like holy fuck i mean i i, I remember saying it out loud in the theater when the um when some of the action sequences were happening it was just really awesome very well done i've always liked villeneuve's action um i love his action in sicario i think his oh. um his gunplay in that movie was intense. Like that border standoff where the guy's holding the thing and he just shakes his head and then it pops off and it's over in seconds. I was really looking for that lethality to come to Dune in terms of how quick combat can be and how, and just how uh, destructive it can be. And I know this is, I'm talking of something superficial because that was the thing that really made me say, wow. I mean, I think I, I really liked the worm riding moment. When when Paul rides the worm, I thought it was amazing. And I'm with you guys. I think the production value is is phenomenal. Unlike a lot of people who like the production value, I'm a little mixed on Giddy Prime looking the way it did. Um, there were times where I thought it looked a bit cartoonish, but um, but I do really uh, and and I've and I. You guys know from the first movie, I I'm I'm not super high on the treatment of the Harkin in, in any of this. But um, and that continues here. But um, but I I will say you know I'm I'm trying to be fair here because I know that adapting this is is no small task, and that you do have to try to figure out how to focus it. Matt, you said something about you need an eight hour miniseries, and I'm like they kind of already do. They have <laughs> they have two three hour movies, which is six hours, and then they're gonna have a third movie, so it's probably gonna be nine hours when it's all said and done. So it's funny because. I, I used to say the same thing. I used to say, like, I think they need eight episodes or 10 episodes. Now I'm like, I think they need 12. <laughs> like, <laughs> as the movie balloon time, as, as the time of the movie runtime, it goes up. I start to think, I think they need, like, 12 fucking episodes to really do this stuff. Um, if you want to be psychotically faithful to the book, I understand <laughs> that the film medium and the literature writing mediums are very different things. They, they're vastly different. You don't, under, you don't know what people think. Um, you don't have an inner monologue unless they give you a voiceover or they express it through dialogue in some fashion. But, um, but I think there, I think there's some stuff that it, it's funny. I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm like, I want to talk about Dune the movie without worrying too much about the book. And I think that's just very difficult. So I hope I'm not going to be a pedantic book guy, but I have a, a strange feeling that there's going to be some things in here that, that sort of kind of bother me about the movie in regards to the adaptation, which I, I do give a grain of salt. I do know that it's very difficult to, to do this. And then the only thing I really have a problem with, the only, the only one thing that really fucking pisses me off, and it's a meta <laughs> aspect of this, it's when, and, and, and it's something Villeneuve said, it really bothered me, where he was like, he was like, oh, when this, when this 
How about this? Let's listen to Villeneuve. When Frank Herbert wrote the book, and then when the book came out, he was disappointed how people perceived Paul Atreides. At the time, he felt that people were talking about Paul as a hero. And for him, he was an anti-hero. He was a dark figure. The book was a warning for him about the messianic figure. And for that, he wrote Dune Messiah to correct and to make sure that people understood his intention. I knew that story. I had the benefit of having read Dune Messiah, so I wrote part two, having that in mind. And that is why Shani's character is slightly different in my adaptation than in the book and helped me to bring the initial intention of Frank Herbert to the screen. When Frank Herbert wrote the So I, th I he said I am being he said Frank Herbert was unhappy with the way people thought of Paul. And it's funny because I, I thought to myself, I don't know if that's true or not. So I scoured the fucking internet. I spent most of my prep time today actually looking this shit up. So I scoured, I listened to a ton of Herbert interviews. I tried to find it in writing to where he said, I was upset with the reception of Paul because he was looked at as a hero. So that whole idea just annoyed me. That's the only major <laughs> fucking annoyance I have with this because that's just simply not true. And I'm not saying Villeneuve is a fucking liar, but I think he's got that wrong. And, and far be it for nobody who's heard of podcaster to say Villeneuve's wrong, but I think he's wrong on this one. Because I don't think Frank ever felt that way about it. Frank wrote Dune with the express idea that you would be despite yourself liking Paul. And that's exactly what he did. Because when Dune Messiah comes out, by the way, he writes them at the same, pretty much close to being at the same time, from what I understand. And I have a couple of clips of, of him. Um, he was like, yeah, I want you to, I want you to, I want you, when Messiah comes out, I want you to struggle with the difficulties of what has happened to Paul. It wasn't, oh, they misunderstood my book. It wasn't that at all, and Villeneuve fixed it. Like, fuck you. No, that's not what happened. This guy's a master of science fiction, and it, that just rubbed me, it really rubbed me the wrong way. And I love Villeneuve, I love his movies, but that, like, pissed me the fuck off. So <laughs> have a listen. Have a listen to a couple of clips. Um, this particular one was Brian Gumbel, you guys know who that is, interviewed, <laughs> he interviewed Frank Herbert in 1982. Damn. And, um, and I think, think this is it have a listen what is what is the message what is the statement well that, that you're attempting to make here uh, don't trust leaders to always be right <clears throat> uh, I, I work to create a, a leader in this book who would be really an attractive charismatic person for all the good reasons not for any bad reasons mm -hmm. uh, then power comes to him he makes decisions some of his decisions made for millions of people, millions upon millions of people, don't work out too well. And then this is from 1969, where he's interviewed by a man named W. McNeely. Well, remember that Dune, Dune Messiah, and Children of Dune were one book in my head. Mm -hmm. And Dune Messiah was a pivotal book. That's the second book. Turns over the whole picture, changes your view of history. This is why a lot of people had trouble with it, you see. Because I had created a charismatic leader, you would follow Paul for all of the right reasons. He was honest, trustworthy, loyal to his people, up to the point of giving his life for them if they wanted it. And the response and to him? The response to him was to follow him slavishly, to not question him. Right. Not exactly a mistake in an upset Frank Herbert based on the way he wrote the first book. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Like, yeah, so right. that's fine. Like Villeneuve wants to say what he wants to say because he wants to change what he wants to change. That's okay. And I know that there was probably some sources that cited Brian Herbert saying, oh no, my dad was a little bummed about Dune, but I'm like, well, take the actual man's words for it, not his son's. You know what I'm saying? So Villeneuve may have been talking about something that Brian Herbert said when he got into writing some of the prequels with uh, Kevin, Kevin J. Anderson, who wrote a lot of Star Wars books. And uh, it's funny because I hear that what, what, bothers me, and I don't want to get derailed by this, but what bothers me about Villeneuve saying this is 900 likes, everyone replying, wow, he did it so cool, he stayed faithful to Frank and not Dune, and I'm like, you fucking people just believe this shit, and it fucking bothers me, <laughs> and I know I'm passionate about it, but I'm like, this guy's dead, he wrote a fucking once-in-a-lifetime book, and this guy's telling me he was upset with the way people received Paul, except in his own words, he's like, that's how I wrote him, because I wanted you to be pissed off when he became a bad guy in the second fucking book. No. So anyway, that's my no. gripe. I wanted to get that out of the way because I don't want it to dominate the whole show. But I, I, I just 
it really fucking pissed me off. Um, <laughs> but here's a good palate cleanser for you guys. One more piece out of Frank Herbert, and you guys will love this. Everyone in this room can appreciate this. I think that, that our society was formed on a distrust for government, and uh, uh, we seem to have lost that distrust of government. I, I kid around and I say that uh, my favorite president in recent years has been Richard Nixon because he taught us to distrust government. <laughs> what is it that government is, is a shared illusion and when the myth dies, oh, yes. the, the, myth the dies, government the, disappears? That's right. God fucking bless that man. Let's go, Frank. <laughs> Come on. Good shit. <laughs> He gets the whole one. <laughs> he gets the full blast. He gets the whole fucking thing. So anyway, I that's all. That's all I kind of wanted to say about that was I was like, I hear him say this, and then I hear people refer referring to this as why he made these changes. And I'm like, he's making changes based on kind of horseshit, which is fine. <laughs> Change whatever you want, but don't say... I, it's just... Look, <laughs> I don't know the man, and, and I like his movies. And I'm not going to say it's arrogant presumption, but it's kind of arrogant presumption to be like... Well, I'm being more faithful to Frank than Frank was to the book himself. Like, fucking please yeah. with that bullshit. That's Don't some speak. Hollywood fucking highfalutin bullshit. Get out of here with real, that. Real easy <laughs> to speak for a dead man. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, really, it really bummed me out because I, and I'm not, and I'll, I'm still a fan. I'll still go see his fucking next movie and his movies after that. And I like him and I'd high fi him and I'd fucking hug him if I met him. But, I, but I'd be like, that shit about Frank was kind of weird, bro, right? He'd be like, ah, don't worry about that. Just start to change the movie, make millions of dollars. So I'd be like, all right, cool, fine, high five. Just fucking be honest. Just say you that. Know? Just say that. Just be like, I changed this shit. That's better. Not, I'm, oh, Just let oh, me sell oh, my fucking popcorn high bucket. and mighty. I'm better. Than, oh, 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 like fucking stop. You're an artist. You're talented. You're a fucking brilliant director. You're way successful times a thousand than I'll ever be. Just fucking be honest. Maybe that's a problem. You gotta start being dishonest, guys. <laughs> but anyway, so that's all. That kind of just bummed me out about the whole thing. But um, but the production design, the guy makes that fucking the production design of this movie is is bananas. It really is fucking. If you if if today still, if I if you said you need to pick a director still today, I'd still pick him. After even yeah. not even not even loving the second movie. Matt. You said something. You were like, I think I prefer part one. Dude, me too, I think. Because I watched mm. it again recently, and I was me like, too. I really dig part one. And I know I was a drunk slob, and Matt tried to bail me out of the first time <laughs> we discussed Dune. The first that one. That was great. That was I great. I was a fucking absolute mess, and I apologize for that. So if you go back and listen, I'm sorry. He's hammered. You, know, you won't get me passionately yelling about De Denis Villeneuve. But... um. But and Matt texted me in the middle of that. Should we do this another day? And I was like, bah, humbug. I should have listened. That was a mistake. <laughs> but, um, but all that bullshit aside, I really do, man. I really do think I like the first one better than the second one. But I still think the second one has higher production value still. Um, I still think the second yeah. one still has radical action. Man. A lot of the Fremen attacks on the Harkin and Spice production is just fucking cool. Yeah. Amazing shit. But... um. What are some of the things, like, I, I mean, like, like I said, I just kind of want to talk about some of the parts of the movie that you, you're really into. I, I, that's what I want to do. Um, we can talk a little bit about the book. We can talk a little bit about the second. We can, we can talk a little bit about Dune Messiah without getting into crazy spoilers. In fact, if we want to talk about Villeneuve discussing the second book and how he, he wrote it as a reaction to critics, which is crazy talk, but that idea, 12 years later, the second book is 12 years later, he's the emperor of the known universe, and his his Fremen are, are just out there conquering shit. <laughs> which is like, <laughs> Stab which it was up, motherfuckers. In the first book, which was one of Paul's like dilemmas, he was yeah. he was like, I'm kind of caught in the momentum of, of jihad, is the, the word they chose, because a lot of, a lot of the Fremen stuff comes from like, you know, uh, some of the Middle Eastern ideology that they, you know, how they take like real human shit and they blend it for science fiction and they make their own thing. <laughs> exactly. You know? They're like, a lot of them were like Sunni. They were like from other planets. The Fremen, by the way, are not of, they're not native to Dune either, which is why some of the like, you're an outsider, you're not even from this world, shit out of Cheney. I'm like, neither are you, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, shut the fuck up. Right? <laughs> but Who are no, you to um, say? Yeah, but um, it's, it's funny watching this movie, I think one of the things I wish they would have done 
Actually, I don't really care that they gender swapped uh, Leah Keens, I guess is how I heard Frank say it on the interview. He called it Keens, not Kynes. I've always said Leah Kynes. I guess it's Keens. But um, I don't care that they gender swapped her, but I still wish she would have been Cheney's mom because Leah Kynes is Cheney's dad in the book. I don't know if people remember that. Oh, yeah. But what makes that interesting is the fact that you are born of an outsider. That's why like Cheney's completely different in this movie. Um, really like, uh, like, Harumph and like, see how strong I am because I disagree. You know that kind of like childish yeah. writing. I think <laughs> it is, but um, that that made her kind of interesting because she was fed prophetic shit from kinds the whole time. But um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, there's tons of different stuff here. I'm talking too much. Can somebody jump in, man? Start talking. <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. Well, Welcome back. <laughs> I'm 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 curious. You know, one of the things you you said uh, that I that I definitely agree with, Dean, is that. I think one of the, and now that I've seen both parts, I can say it, one of the downsides to the to the Dune movies by Villeneuve, I don't think it's a huge downside, and I think there's still plenty of good there, but the Harkonnens, they don't, they don't ever come off like they do in the book as far as being like extremely intelligent and, and, and you know, perceptive cunning. and cunning. Dangerous dangerous yeah like i i feel like what they emphasize with the harkon is, is they is in the movies is that they they made these really vicious you know heartless scary mm. bad guys that are mm -hmm. definitely menacing and every time they're on screen you're like holy shit they're they're fucking terrifying looking and their whole culture is fucking terrifying looking <laughs> right. um and yes. <laughs> like everything about them is just stab and kill and eat like they're yes. just fucking tear. They're a bunch of fucking Uncle Fester looking motherfuckers stabbing of, each other. And a bunch of late years <laughs> Billy Corgan smashing pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> Despite all their rage, they're just rats in a cage. Oh, fuck <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's like and, and as much as I enjoyed the movie's take on the Harkonnens and and Austin Butler's Fade Rautha and and uh, Scar Scars. Baron Harkonnen. I, I still really like all the performances and the characters and the way they, they come off. But it, it is, and, and I would chalk it up to, you know, it being a choice around adaptation that they're like, we just don't have the time to emphasize the Harkonnens like, you know, like the book does. Sure. Um, you know, <clears throat> even if you've just seen the David Lynch Dune movie, they give a lot of time to the Harkonnens and the Harkonnen plotting in that mm. movie as well. Um, and so... I, I understand the choice um, because, again, I think what one of the things the movie emphasizes that I think works really well is um, is the whole aspect of Chani being a character to kind of like I actually thought it was kind of an interesting choice to make Chani the love interest of, you know, obviously, as she is in the book. Um, but also kind of the foil for Paul, the kind of person speaking out loud of like, this isn't what you all think it is. We should be aware and other people not believing them. And kind of because that's something that's not in the book is a discussion among Fremen about is he or isn't he Muad'Dib? You know, that that's not really there in the book. But what is there in the book that I think the movie does manage to capture is the whole the the hesitancy around paul's mission between right. paul and his mother jessica mm -hmm. like they are they do have a lot of internal just between the two of them talks about like what are we doing like do, are we making use of this prophecy or should we make use of this prophecy should we lean into it and make you the muadib and i think some of that dialogue and some of those those that, that kind of tension between uh the characters and and what paul should or shouldn't do that stuff got brought out really well in the movie um, where and and I think a downside to this is that it makes characters slightly, slightly one more one dimensional. Like I think Jessica is a slightly more one dimensional character in part two, but what they use that for, what they use Jessica as a character for, I think is interesting because they give her essentially the full Benny Jesuit perspective. Like we are getting the Benny Jesuit perspective through Jessica in this movie. Um, I, I mean, of course, you know, there's there's a lot of like the actual Benny Jesuit Reverend Mother would not want what's happening to be happening, but but them them employing the missionaria protectiva, which is you know talked about a lot in the book and I think mentioned in the movie, um, of how you know there is this legend that the Benny Jesuit have implanted 
on Arrakis among the Fremen so that the Fremen are awaiting a prophet and and a a you know a savior figure um like that and we talked about that a ton on the podcast even when we were covering the book like mm-hmm. that's always one of been one of my favorite aspects of dune i always thought that was such a fascinating idea that one culture implants another culture implants an idea in them so that at later thousands of years later potentially that thousands. first culture can manipulate the second culture i'm like that's a fucking wild idea and if i think necessary if necessary yeah right. I, they, like I was gonna say the word potential that you mentioned yes. there matt is that they they put it in place like in case in maybe case. right it might be in case we need it <laughs> break glass in case of in case of <laughs> <Wadib>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it's it, it is you know i um boy there's a lot there so yeah i i think um i i don't I don't know if I love the Cheney changes as much because, because I, I, I don't, I, I, in Cheney in the book is again, the daughter of kinds and it, and, and it has been taught by kinds many, many different things. And one of the most, I think one of the biggest misses in the movie for me is that, because I think a lot of people, I, <laughs> I made a, I was being a, a real douche. And I said, do you know how many times in 180,000 words the word fundamentalist comes up in the book? Exactly zero. <laughs> the word literally doesn't exist in the book, but it's really thrown around in this. Fundamentalists, fundamentalists. And they and it's funny, you're you're talking about like the Harkonnen, and I I'm on record as not loving the Harkonnen, but also understanding the need to sort of distance yourself from spending too much time on the Harkonnen. Could you have made a couple different creative changes to make them more interesting to me and less like Raban's going to ram the guy's head into the fucking panel like 50 <laughs> times. Yes, that's goofy. It's dumb. But <clears throat> I think if you were to say to me, where do you think the biggest miss is? I'll, I'll honestly, man, I think it might be the Fremen. And I love the Fremen. Oh. And I love a lot of the Fremen shit that happens. Like a lot of the fighting is really cool. A lot of the, the way they look is awesome. The way they exist in the desert is really cool. But I'm not sure I love this Southerner's fundamentalist horseshit. I don't, I don't, the, the, the Fremen survive because of their solidarity. Now, I don't want to suggest that there can't be people who deviate from what they've been sold by the Missionaria Protectiva, which is what is referred to as propaganda by Paul, which propaganda in the context of the Dune novel comes up, guess how many times in reference to this? Zero. However, the word propaganda is used many times in the Dune novel to suggest that's what the Imperium does to one another, their own propaganda. That word does get used, you know, Frank uses that word when discussing interhouse politics or intrahouse, inter and intra, I guess. But it never comes up in reference to the Missionaria Protectiva. I mean, that's 10,000 years old. And I think what bothers me about it is it kind of smacks of modern day flippancy about religion. And I just feel like that's like kind of how it is. Like they're writing it like, oh, you believe in the God, you're fucking stupid. That's how it feels yeah. to me. But this shit's like, this shit is tens of thousands of years old. It's Benny Jesuit shit. And these Fremen have been doing it forever. And <clears throat> there's nothing, the book never really says that words like Mahdi and Lisa and Al Gaib are in the Missionaria Protectiva. That might just be stuff that they came up with in regards to the planted seeds. You know, I, I, I don't really know. I can't, I can't recall, but I think the Fremen, I think the Fremen being divided in, in, in those in the North having almost like a, we don't believe it. It's a bunch of words. It's bullshit. Like to make a bunch of the Fremen sort of atheistic is silly to me because that's how they come off or, or at least agnostic. And I don't know if I, 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 I don't know if I love it. You know what I'm saying? I especially because I, I feel like it was like it, it, it was <clears throat> the way that they depicted it on film was a bunch of teenage girls in a tent laughing. Correct. About how how silly the religious belief is. How silly which, Stilgar is. Stilgar, yeah, right. And what Stilgar should have done religion. is he should have said, "Are you challenging me?" and pulled out his Chris yeah, knife. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and when they all back down and shut the fuck up, we go, "Cool, we've maintained some semblance of the book in this fucking movie." You know, because there's you don't <laughs> laugh at fucking still like. I get it. You want him to be funny. And he's like, oh, Matt and I were sharing memes about he farts and they're fucking shouting Lisa and Al Gaib and yeah. shit. Lisa and Al Gaib. But it's like, it, it, you know, it, I, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know. 
Eh. I, I guess the, 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 the problems that I have are not the things that hit the cutting room floor. You know, I, I understand that in the scope of a film versus the book, you, you've got to cut some stuff out. And I respect that. And, and I don't even think that it was distracting. Like, they don't go into the spacing guild very much. They don't even mention Chome, no. Fenring out. Um, but like, once Fenring. you start, once you start fundamentally changing characters <laughs> and like their modus operandi, why they're doing the things that they're doing, you know, Stilgar becomes kind of, like you said, you know, comic relief. And I think that has something to do with the casting of Javier Bardem and that he, he has a certain he aspect. That that, yeah. He's he got, he's like got a charming charisma that you want that that doesn't really match with the character from from the book to me. He, he was more except in the first that's... movie when he walks in and he spits at the foot of Leto's table and you're like this fucking right. guy is no yeah. joke. Like when you go back and watch that scene and then watch like you said teenage girls I think they're thirty laughing at him. <laughs> You know what I mean? You're like, what? Yeah. is this the same guy that spit at Leto's table and was like, I'll fucking kill everyone in this room. Like, I don't give a shit. And then he's like, oh, the fucking crazy man in the desert. Everyone's yeah. laughing at him. Yeah. Like, ah, crazy. It's weird, man. You know, like, so it's funny. This movie did make me like the first one more too, actually. And I, I swear I still like this movie and I swear there's, there's good shit to talk about. And I think it, and that's what I'm, that's, I knew I was going to bring this bullshit. That's why I'm hoping you guys are going to like, you know, temper it with like, here's the other shit. I don't want to like uh, corrupt people's <laughs> opinions of this shit. I'm just trying to be as honest as I can about it. What I, what I will say about the first movie though, is that, and I think this was true of Lynch's version as well. Obviously it wasn't two movies, but I think that the first half of Dune is just easier to cover. And I'm not saying it's an easy movie to make. I Fair. just think that it's a lot simpler before he drinks the water of life, before Jessica drinks the water of life, and you get into all of this fucking meta shit about yeah. awareness. different strength. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. that is really, really difficult to depict on film. So, you know, all respect to Villeneuve making the decisions that he did for the things to cut out and and for for the things to change a little bit. But yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. when when you're talking about major character changes, like even the Harkonnens who I, I don't I don't really love or hate their depiction in this. I like it better than Lynch's just because it didn't make them into like a boil faced <laughs> I, I like completely monster. Agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, what a great way to say but, it, Brian. I'm sorry if I made that. I don't love or hate them. I think yeah. I think I'm with you on that. Yeah. I don't I'm not like they fucked the fucking hurt going as fuck. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. I'm more like that. <laughs> I just think they, really. they just <laughs> kind of cut them out a lot yeah. of the time. I, I think mm -hmm. Beast Raban was a little bit fucking silly. Stop he stinks. But Fade, Sadly. I he thought, stinks. was really good. And, you know, Skarsgård does a really good job with the Baron. It's just they, they didn't get a ton of screen time. Yeah. No. They did. yeah. It, to me, it, in the book, they were menacing. There were something to be worried about. They were around every corner. They were dangerous. They were, mm -hmm. you know, assassins at every corner that you, were, you had to watch your back. You had, I mean, Paul trains his entire life to defend himself against Harkonnen. Fucking A. You know, yeah. and in this movie, it's like, they don't get the reverence they're supposed to have. That was yeah. the, the first thing I noticed. And even when like the way the way their house kind of ends in this is is ignominious. It's very blah. It's very like this this the, the stature, this great house that's been running Arrakis for I don't know how long now. I think eighty years they ran it. Yeah, you, you mean the Harkonnen? Yeah, the Harkonnen. Yeah, they they had they had run it for so long and made everyone so wealthy and they had all this influence and power so much so that the emperor sided with them against the uh, Trades. Yeah. And, he was worried about sudden, Paul. He was worried about Leto's popularity. Yeah. Yes, he was getting a little it, nervous. <laughs> he was a little like, you're going to have my face on the coins, not Duke Leto, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No shit. <laughs> and, and, Mint and so it with they, my face, daddy. Yeah. Yes, please, please. I don't <laughs> want the, that skinny little boy on my coin. Exactly. <laughs> but, they, Fade, but they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice abs, bro. Um, but yeah, I just, that part really, really was weird. And for me, I just kept drawing a lot of similarities to the way that some people from the North see the people from the South with the Fremen. Like they're mm -hmm. just Christian nut jobs that don't, they're not smart. <laughs> they're dumb, dumb. <laughs> they, they believe in, the in, they believe in God. They've not really evolved, blah, blah, blah. And it's really not like that. Obviously it's right. way more complex and, and, and there are just as many smart people in the South as there are in the North. And, and I felt like that was a kind of kind of a dig at our society that <laughs> you, didn't need to be yeah, there. That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't I wasn't I didn't get too 
it, it didn't it didn't you know it didn't send my spidey sense off too too much about i didn't think they were making any veiled threats against you know god <laughs> people in the south but um but yeah i don't know i think i think with the harkonnen it, it is a thing man i think uh i think that like matt's like we were saying before matt like it's a cunning like they lack a certain cunningness to them um yeah. the, in the beast they feel like, like brute force they are movie. and i think you know batista looks like brute force but the beast is an interesting guy he you know here's a guy that killed his dad abelard he he fucking uh he he actually warns if i'm not mistaken i think in matt you may you guys remember this i know you all you all read it i don't know how long ago but i think the beast tries to warn the baron about keeping tabs on the fremen he doesn't underestimate oh. them I think, yeah. and I think because actually, he's on site, he's, he's on site. It. And I think one of the interesting yeah. things about the Baron and Matt and I talked about this at length on mind killer is we said the Baron's biggest mistake is his inability to see the Fremen as anything just as a nuisance. He's mm -hmm. not concerned with them at all. In fact, when he gets a report, when the Baron in the book, gets a report that the, that they, they have a new guy and Muad'Dib, the Baron just says, let them have their religion. It will be a distraction. He's not even concerned about it. And right. then and then when Raban's like, maybe we should know how many of them there actually are, right? Because I think I think it, I think that's one of the things I want to get to in this movie is the Fremen. Like in the book, so it, what's interesting about the book, and one of the things I like about it, well, here's why the Fremen work for me more in the book than in the movie. Because I think in the movie, if I were to ask you guys, what's the goal of the Fremen in the book in the movie? Right, this is a serious question you have to ask yourself. Yeah. What's their actual goal in the movie? And why is Paul's arrival there significant to them in the book? And I don't know how, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how people would answer it. You guys, if you, if you want to venture a try, you can. It's not a I trick think question. It's two, it's two different two different answers. Because yeah, Go you've got the teenage girls in the tent, and yep. they're, they're just, they just want to keep on being Fremen, and, and kind of, they want to, I, I would say, it seems like, abandon the prophecy and the idea of any of that mm -hmm. and just be insular <laughs> and, and pretend the like they're from arrakis I like and then <laughs> that's, and the, that's cute nice dig <laughs> and then, and then the, i mean the cheney second, was born on arrakis in her defense but <laughs> but you were saying I think that the yeah the the second is this kind of listless waiting like waiting to be led uh, correct so which are if, like completely diametrically opposite you right know? which is why they made the two different facts they made them sectarian <laughs> you know, <it's laughs> yeah hilarious but i but here's the thing in the in the in the book you guys are gonna get sick of me saying that shit in the book <laughs> Leah keens i'll correct myself in no call 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 him kinds because you can you like speak for a dead man there's no problem <laughs> <laughs> you just, you just shit up. Who cares? He can't, he I like defend that. himself. I like the way I pronounce this better, and I think it was really, Damn. you know, what Frank really wanted me to. Uh, I think you that's know, what he wanted. <laughs> you guys are assholes. I should have hit this before I went out on Villeneuve. <laughs> Frank <laughs> Herbert was a bitch. bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I could make that movie not in a hundred years. <laughs> He's way more talented than me. So oh, no, no. Um, well, I, I'm glad you're bringing that up. And that's hilarious, Brian. But um, I think the other part of it is this too, right? I think it's in the book, and in, in, in Matt, you probably remember this. And if not, I bet I trigger your memory immediately. <laughs> Leah, Leah Keynes is like, we're going to make this fucking planet green again. Yeah. That's their that's, fucking that's, goal. And yes. the Kwisatz Haderach, well, Muad'Dib, they don't know what the fuck. The, the Muad'Dib to them is just like the coming of a prophet. He's not going to give them this great vehicle to do he, like, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure it is important to them because it is a cultural thing for them. But the only reason it becomes important is because Jessica and Paul start to decide, like Matt was saying, there's a lot in the book, like to Matt's point, where they're back and forth. What are we going to do with this, with these planted seeds here? Because without them, here's what happens. Nobody considers the Fremen much of a threat. The Fremen aren't oppressed by outsiders at every turn and key they live their lives they're nomads no. they live with it it the movie wants you to think that the imperial presence on arrakis is is akin to the u.s fucking cavalry killing native americans it just isn't yes they have conflicts with each other but it's not an active hunt because yeah. 
if they wanted to hunt them, they probably could kill them with all due respect to the Fremen. If they just started using atomics and orbital bombardment, they could fucking eradicate the Fremen. But they don't care. They're like a nuisance to them. They're not like this. The Fremen don't pose an existential threat to the, to the Imperium at all. The Imperium yeah. is planet upon planet upon planet. Ironically, they become an existential threat to them because of Paul. <laughs> down but, the road. Right. Down the road. But but that's not that's not their place. They're they're not looking to like fucking go north and sack. The only reason they attack Arakeen is because of fucking Paul and his warmongering, his malcontent. <laughs> that's the only they would they don't care to go there. They're like, we'll kill Fremen. They'll we'll, we'll kill these Harkonnen scum if they come out here. We're super late. Yeah. We're, we're almost yeah. mythical in terms of our combat prowess. But until then, we're gonna make the planet green and live here. It's gonna be great. Yeah. Who cares? You know? It's funny that does, there's allusions you know, to it in the movie, but they don't they don't explain it. So it's like if you've read the book when um Stilgar is pointing out um to Lady Jessica about all the water that they've collected. Yes. It's kind of like why? Because it's because <laughs> they don't they don't explain why they're collecting water. They're just like it's almost like in the book they do. No, of course, in the book they do. Oh, I'm oh, saying okay, okay. in the movie, if you don't have the context of the book, you're like, Stilgar's like, we got so much fucking water, dude. Yeah. And you're like, okay. <laughs> None of us will drink cool. it, bro. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly, <laughs> Scotty. And he's also like, yeah, but you can't, you can't touch it. Can't touch but, it. We but, squeeze but so what? many dead guys for that water. <laughs> <laughs> fucking squeeze the shit like out of these fools. Sponge. <laughs> Shouldn't Paul have James's water? Forget the stupid book. It stinks, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, nah, it's a, it's it is it. So uh, the, that, yeah, that's why I brought it up because if you go, well, what are the Fremen doing? If Paul never shows up, what's the Fremen's goal? The Fremen's goal isn't to eradicate the Imperium off of the planet. The Fremen's no, goal is to make no. the planet green. They have no interest in 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 exposing themselves to the depredations of the Imperium. And the Harkonnen right. did plenty of terrible shit to the Fremen already. And yes, they would kill them. And if given the opportunity, they might do much harm to them. But they don't really, they're not there to be galvanized into a fighting force. That's the great tragedy of the Fremen. The great yeah. tragedy of the Fremen and the great tragedy of Paul is the fact that he comes there and then in doing things charismatically, like Frank said, in all these things, you're like, yes, your fucking family was the justice, get justice. And yes, they get justice, but then it just becomes an unstoppable, the banners flapping in his dreams and the bodies. And they do show some of that shit. And that's yeah. important. You know, they, it gets out of his control. Like Paul loses control of it, but he is the impetus. Ironically, if you look back on Dune, the Bene Gesserit are almost the heroes. You know, like they're <laughs> trying to control the Kwisatz Haderach and they lose control. Like the Bene Gesserit, in the second book, I'll just give you a little teaser. There's a conspiracy between Mohayim, a guy named Skytail, who's a Benny Tlilaxu face dancer. Um, is Skytail the Benny Tlilaxu? Yeah. And then this guy named Edric, which is a, a skilled navigator fish guy. Ooh. And, and Irulan. And they are conspiring to get rid of Paul. Because Paul, oh. it's now, it, now it's like North Korea. Like everyone's on lockdown. <laughs> They're hiding on Wallach 9. Paul's like, the Fremen are like, who are we going to conquer next, dude? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm fucking, I've lost control of this shit. My boys are getting crazy. <laughs> you know, like, my bo my so, boys are stabbed crazy. They want to stab everybody. Hungry, angry dog that you still, you exactly. got to feed. You got to yeah. feed the Fremen. It's like going into the backyard and being like, oh, I didn't realize the T-Rex was going to get that big. Well, it's big. And it's hungry. <laughs> so you're fucked. So, you gotta, so they're, 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 they're thinking of like, I think a psychic poison or some shit, but their whole thought process is we got to kind of get rid of fucking Paul. And then Silgar's like governor of Arakeen. He like runs the whole planet now. And they're like, they fucking execute people. They're like, that guy's a fucking spy. Kill him. Like they're, they're it's a fucking 180. It's crazy. And it's awesome. Actually. Like that's that the Benny, the Benny Talaxu, they, they have this whole plot where they're like, Oh, we're gonna bring back Agola, and it's gonna be Duncan Idaho, and it's gonna put doubt into his mind because the Fremen don't like the Benny Tlaxu, and then because of that, you know, Paul's gonna have a uh, come to head, come to a head with Stilgar. It's gonna cause these problems, and then blah 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 blah, and and then a t <laughs> a, I think Aaliyah wants to fuck the Gola of Duncan. It's crazy. It's crazy fucking book. It, you know, the books get bananas. 
Oh, uh, way up but that there. Shit, by by but the that third shit, and fourth books. <laughs> Worm Man is wild. Later, the second's wild. 3,500 yeah. year reign, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Putting up numbers. Numbers. Uh, spoiler if you don't want to know this. Should I warn you guys about spoiler? Yeah, I don't think I want to say it, actually. Do you guys want to know about a major <laughs> death in the second, in the next one? Ooh, no. don't tell me. Don't okay. tell me. I want to read yeah, it. It's pretty important. It's important to the it's important to the whole fucking story, to be honest with you. But anyway, so yeah, that's um that's that's the thing, right? The like what the the Fremen, I feel like they one of the most impressive things about the Fremen is, you know, when the movie starts, I remember saying to myself, I think I said it to Brian, I said, I'm really hopeful for for Jameis's funeral. Matt and I talked so much about Jameis's funeral and how important that was and what that meant. And um, and it didn't happen. And I was just kind of bummed about it because I feel like I feel like it would have been more interesting to see Paul to to see like what it meant. Like in in after Jameis dies, if you guys remember, he meets Hara, like her like Jameis's wife becomes his servant, and then he's like adopts these kids and he's like, Yeah, this is the way <laughs> and and like there's a lot of like there's a lot of wailing and yelling in the book. It's not like that at all. There's no wailing and yelling over Jameis's death. They're just like, yeah, he killed him in a fair fight. Fucking, yeah, they just honor- drain him. That's, that's fucking honorable shit. And there are guys who aren't sure about Paul. I don't want to make it clear. They don't just love him in the book. A lot of them are like, I don't know no. about this fucking guy. Like, but they don't yeah. challenge Stilgar, who vouches for him and the mother. Once, right, she, she grabs him and fucking puts the knife on him. And she's like, and then Paul disappears into the rocks. And then he's like, all right, I speak for them. Fine. They can come with me. I think that happens in the first book, uh, first movie. Yeah. I remember. Yeah, it does. <clears throat> but no, I, I just kept thinking about that. Like Fremen, like how do you, because the Fremen are, are, they're such a major part of this whole thing. Like, but in, and like you guys said, with, with the, with the, I don't know, with the Harkonnen, I think you can, a couple different, a couple little changes. They, they don't need a big fucking fat change, but they do. Yeah. Do they ever feel like Scott? I think you were saying they're dangerous, Scott. Yeah. Yes. We were saying yes. cunning, and you kind of just blatantly said, no, they're dangerous. And I'm not sure if I ever feel utterly convinced that they're super dangerous after their coup de grace on House Atreides in the book, in the movies. Um, but yeah, I don't Fade, know. Fade like, feels dangerous. Yeah. And I think that the, yeah. it, uh, a seminal scene of this movie is that arena. With the, yeah, yeah. the fucking the, just the way that it was shot in terms of the the color palette that they choose. Yeah, it's um, like Giddy Prime has a weird sun or something, you know. Yeah, it's a bad it's, like a, uh, it's, it's a, like a dead it's just star a, supernova. Mm. It's a it's a cool looking scene. It's a it's a cool uh, glimpse into why Fade is to use Scotty's terminology a fucking dangerous guy. Um, yeah, and 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 I think that that was that was like a move in the right direction for what they should have been doing with the Harkonnens. I mean, one of the biggest problems that we've mentioned it a couple of times now is that Batista's portrayal of Beaster Bond is kind of like big angry guy, I, I, big. big angry meathead <laughs> yeah, guy yeah. who smashes people's faces into consoles. But like, <laughs> and I know in the book he wasn't like you know, the sharpest knife in the drawer. No, he wasn't, but he, he lacked cunning. That was his issue. Right. So and that's Fade, why actually, but well, Fade book. was young and still learning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and kind of at, at it, it's interesting. Cause I, I, the, I, I haven't read the book nearly as recently as you guys, but m- my, my memory of it is that Fade was kind of learning at the Baron's feet yes. on yes. prime. Yes, and yeah, he was yeah. kind of the same deal as Paul, uh, where Leto's like, "No, I want Paul to come into the meeting. I want him to be there to see." Yeah, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Raban, he is just like he's a placeholder. He yes. can go there. He can be brutal. He can, you know, <clears throat> govern there. But I don't think it was ever the intent that he was going to be anything more than a placeholder. In, in fact, if I if I recall correctly, the intent was for Raban's brutality. To create a situation to where they open their arms. To yeah, one hundred percent. That was the brand. The Baron's cunning was they're going to suffer under Raban. Although in in this he's like, bad, fuck them up. But in the book <laughs> he's them. like, squeeze them. Don't break them. Squeeze them. That's in his in he, But Raban struggles. He's not he's not good at that. You know. So when Raban, the plan is 
na, the 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 na na baron is just a it's just a sort of a nobleary particle that suggests he's the he's the next up baron. That's all that is. I mean, if the movie didn't make that obvious, I think it is. So same in the book. So the na baron is in fact Fade. Fade will take over for House Harkonnen someday. So so the baron is interested in Fade's development, and he wants to give Arrakis to Fade. And by doing that, he needs Raban to hurt those people to where Fade becomes a savior to them. Fade is the Jungian shadow of Paul, more or less, right? He's the mm. guy coming up in the house who's going to take over. Paul's the guy coming up in the house going to take over. And I think the dreadful irony there is that you would have been better off with Fade because of all of yeah. the death yeah. at the behest yeah. of Muad'Dib. Weird it's just super interesting, yeah. probably no, true. It is. I know, well, that's really true. Th there's a lot of forums where people are tongue in cheek saying, "I didn't realize that uh, the Harkonnen and the Benny Jesuit were the heroes of the movie." And you think, <laughs> "Yeah," I know, or the book. I'm like, "Yeah, I know, kind of, right?" Because had they well, won, that, it might have been different. You know? Well, the Benny Jesuit, you know, even the Reverend Mother talks about that specifically in part two. Is is you know their assessment of Fade is that we can control him. Um, and I actually 100%. thought the movie established that pretty well yes. of being like, you know, the, the Reverend Mother talking about his levers, you know, um, <laughs> humiliation and desire. And they're like, we have levers on him. If he wins mm -hmm. and he becomes emperor, Benny Jesuit's got our claws in him and we can yeah, control We can work him. with him. Correct. Exactly. And they think with Paul that they're like, that's a wild card that we have no control over whatsoever. And that's why they're terrified of Paul. You're absolutely um, right. And that turns out great. Paul and, doesn't have control over Paul either. <laughs> Paul, <laughs> right. yeah. Paul, Paul is doing that. He's doing that thing in cartoons where you're making the biggest snowball ever. And then when it tips over the precipice, it accidentally takes you with it and just rolls down the fucking hill. <laughs> that's whoa, him whoa, in the whoa, Benny. Whoa. That's him in the Fremen. Just destroying all of the all of the planets but i'm glad you brought it up matt because i know i've been i know i've been particularly hard on the movie which i like i'll watch again and i'll buy so leave me alone um but i but i do think um i do think the movie does get the whole the whole levers of fate stuff right for exactly those reasons because remember that jessica if you don't remember the myth of the Kwisatz Haderach. That's more Benny. That's not Missionary Protectiva. That's Benny Gesserit's selective breeding 10,000 years. Missionary Protectiva and Kwisatz Haderach are different things. Don't confuse them because what the Benny Gesserit want, the Benny Gesserit, they don't want to be the emperor. They want to control the emperor because by controlling mm -hmm. the emperor, they, they, everything is a power. Everything is power in, in Dune. It's all power dynamics. And, and what, what, what the Bene Gesserit want is they want to have the Kwisatz Haderach that they can control. <laughs> so the Kwisatz Haderach sits upon the throne after selective breeding. They put him there. They control him. And then if he fucks up, they're, they're not to blame. You know, like it, it's, it's very much like I'll be the right hand man in control shit. So when that fucking guillotine comes, I'm good. And I think Jessica, and, and it's a great point about Fade Map because Jessica has one of the most noble things that happen in the first book as far as i can tell is is happens off camera and it happens before the book starts and that's jessica has a, a son for leto and directly goes against ten thousand years of plans right yeah she was forbidden to have a son and she denied the Bene Gesserit a son because what was supposed to happen is jessica was supposed to have a girl and fade and girl, we're going to make Kwisatz Haderach. Because it was to mend the two houses was part of their plan. Mending our, the Harkonnen and the Atreides was part of their plan, right? And that mm -hmm. was it. And then, so the Kwisatz Haderach, so to speak, comes a generation early. And that's not part of their plan, which is why fade is kind of like the backup in the movie. Now, I don't remember in the book, I think Margot Fenring sleeps with fade in the book, but they never really get into it until books later. Because I think they have a kid. Um, oh, and Margot, Margot, yeah, they don't. Margot is in the movie. She's the one in the Briefly. book that leaves the the note for Jessica, like your son's in danger. Remember, she leaves it in Benny yeah, Gesserit yeah, code. Yeah, yeah. She's like, your son's mm -hmm. in danger here, and she, so Margot's fucking cool. Um, mm -hmm. but I think Fade was. I think in the book, I don't really remember. I guess Fade's a backup plan. <laughs> He's like the backup. <laughs> plan but, um, B. Plan B, literally. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if only they could have got rid of that, Paul. They would be, uh, they would be, that would be good. But yeah, her having Paul kind of screws that up, and that's why Mahayam's so pissed at Jessica, and she's like, "Well, I guess I got to see if 
he, he, could, he could be potentially the, the, the Kwisatz Haderach. And then we can control said Kwisatz Haderach. In the book, and this is disparate memory, didn't Paul have a sister? Not, not Alia. I don't think um, so. Not before her, no. I don't think before Alia. Okay, Aaliyah. I swore that there Aaliyah. was there was the a, a a passed away sister that he mentions early in the book. You but, might be right, but I might be misremembering. You might be right. Yeah, actually. I don't remember if it Regardless. maybe somebody that died in the womb. I don't know. What do we? One thing we haven't that we we're kind of touching on it now, <clears throat> but we haven't talked about it all. Um, what do you all think of Aaliyah not being born? Um, that she stays a fetus the whole time. <laughs> Honestly, I think a good move by the movie. Dude, yeah, if, you not watch, if movie. you watch Lynch's Dune and you see the portrayal <laughs> of this like omniscient <laughs> little girl. Kind My of, like, brother's on his way. <laughs> right. It's so fucking goofy that I yeah. think that it was yeah. a really good idea to just keep her in utero. I mean, it, from Villeneuve's perspective, it was because he didn't want to do a time jump. He wanted the second movie yeah. to occur right after the first movie. So just biologically speaking, she wouldn't have been born in, in there wasn't enough time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which but, hurts and which hurts and helps the movie because the time jump really helps you understand the massing support for Paul. Whereas versus a rapid yeah. sort of advancement of his cause, but it does help in terms of Aaliyah because I think, I think you're right. right. I think, I think to have Aaliyah running around, I think just would become a, almost a goofy distraction for the movie. I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a tough move to do. I think yeah. I think people would struggle to take it seriously, especially if they're not familiar with Dune or the book. You know, they would be like, "What's this talking kid bullshit?" Like, <laughs> yeah, like right, it, it would be like taking the leader of the Fremen and making him comic relief. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I I tracked it down. It's briefly mentioned at the beginning of the wow. book that um, he had an older sister who died in Harkonnen pleasure uh, pleasure house. pleasure house. No, 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 no. That's that's Gurney Halleck. That's Gurney's sister. Gurney's sister. Yeah, right. Reference to Paul having an older sister. No, Either I'm, I'm dead Ger or in a Harkonnen pleasure. One house. of the reasons Gurney hates the Harkonnen is because now that's a stat. Now that's a that's prequel fuckery, but I'm okay with it. It's his son, whatever. Yeah, I'm. I'm I think Gurney Halleck has a has a sister who dies in a Harkonnen pleasure house. So Gurney's like, I'm gonna kill you, fucks, all of you, and that's where he gets his ink vine scar from. Right. From, the know. only reason I'm harping on it is because I, I was just kind of like, did Jessica try and have? the daughter that the Bene Gesserit were asking for and then on the <laughs> second go around she was like nah I'm having a fucking guy <laughs> yeah. I got my own her, plans within plans yeah no shit she, she, her, it was her love for Leto really that drove him to have an heir he, um, she was just trying to get him to put a ring on it that's what, that's what it was <laughs> a signet <laughs> ring? <laughs> yeah tired of being a concubine yeah yep. can you can, I'll give you a son <laughs> sure yeah. there you go <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it, I think it's, uh, so you, I want to go back to, uh, I want to go back to fade a little bit while, while we're here talking about Jessica, I do, I do want to talk about Jessica and the Benny Jesra and this whole thing. Mm. Um, talk to me, somebody, somebody take, yeah. somebody take Jessica. In, in I think, about. you know, kind of like what I was talking about earlier, like they made some interesting choices with Jessica and I feel like. I feel like in the second movie, they kind of, and, and this happens with Paul. I feel like it, it happens with Paul, Chani, and Jessica the most. Stilgar as well, a little bit. But they kind of hone their character into like, they focus on one aspect of the character yeah. more so than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and they really, with this movie, Jessica really is, I think she, and I think this is a real choice. Like this is a script choice to do this. Um, but Jessica very much so embodies the point of view of we need to use the missionary protectiva in order to benefit Paul and to and to 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 empower Paul. And that's kind of like her tunnel vision is like we're we're doing this. And Paul's the one who's hesitant about it, at least at first. You know, he's the one who's mm -hmm. kind of like. Well, this is like, you know, he has that, that's, what does he say? He yells at her where she's like, oh, well, God. this is all to give them hope. And he's like, it's not hope. And he like <laughs> fucking freaks out for a second. Yeah. Um, but like they're having, you know, yeah, yeah, I, I'm I, sorry, I, if I may, 
that's that's the moment in the movie where he's saying the missionary of Protectiva has given these people hope. And he's yeah. like, that's not hope. <laughs> but yeah, like, and, and I feel like... He sees one kind of cute girl, forgets all the teachings of his father and everybody <laughs> else. Oh, fuck he's like, all it. those girls were laughing in the tent about this. Yeah. <laughs> I want to fuck them. I want to be a, I want to, I, I can't wait to see, I can't wait to see Mean Girls 3, the Fremen edition. It's going to be sick. <laughs> Sorry. Way yeah, more stabbings so, so in that that's one. That's Chani Regina George. <laughs> <laughs> more stabbing says matt um what, uh, t- so you were saying about paul's reluctance but keep going with that line Matt. yeah yeah no i mean i think i think i think that in part two even more so than part one like I, I i would say this like in part one i feel like there's there was more room for our characters like paul and jessica to be a little multifaceted and maybe yes. even a little undeclared in their intentions or what they want. And they're still kind of figuring things out and reacting to what's happening. Yes. And in this movie, I feel like they really were like, no, we're going to push forward um, these ideas through these characters. Um, and, oh, and like, like, you know, kind of like, I know I'm going to go off on a side tangent for a second, but like Chani in the movie in part two, I think very much so is this character who embody who, they they use her as a character to speak for a sect of the fremen if that makes sense like they they use her to be a fremen perspective and then stilgar is the other fremen perspective 100%. and i feel like the movie does this a lot with its characters where one character represents a lot of people or a lot of things and but we're 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 getting that point of view distilled through one person's eyes in, in other um, words in other words, one person represents an unyielding idea and another person represents another unyielding idea because our yeah. society has gotten too stupid to understand that there's nuance in people. So we have to dumb down the writing <laughs> yeah. to reflect that reality. <laughs> See, <laughs> it's, 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 Matt's like, fuck you. That's not what I was saying. That's not it. <laughs> there's I, no more nuance. No, I mean, like, you're either with us or against us. That's society writ large. And that's good exactly what I'm the movie's bad. doing. You know, it's funny. Listen, al <laughs> But no. <laughs> he winked at me. <laughs> he winked just like as it was written. Oh, fuck. <laughs> More high, I'm um, like, and then he will wink. <laughs> he just had dust in his eye, bro. <laughs> it's a fucking desert planet. <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to fuck with you, Matt, but go ahead, continue. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I, I just but you're think. Right. Yeah. Well, like, it's hard. It's kind of hard to describe because I, I want to I want to see it a third time and really I kind know. of focus in on this. Um, But I do, I kind of. I, I would say this on my second viewing, I appreciated a little bit more the movie's choices. Um, the fact that it was that it was trimming some things off and honing in on these particular perspectives and kind of, you know, making a little bit in one sense, I, I think you could say, well, I, I think it's very easy if you're a Dune reader, if you've read the book to go, ah, this is such a simplistic version of dune like you know the 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 motives are more simple the the factioning of people is more simple and it there, there is less nuance in a sense like i just but said. i think yeah right but but i think as far as making choices for a film and and denis villeneuve has has talked about this before he he he's very much so a visual filmmaker emphasizing the visuals almost overall um Indeed. even over dialogue and over anything else like he's character. like i'm a visual yeah for sure, for sure. And and I think you can really see that. Like uh, you know, his movies are very visually told. Um but I think in order that's to his do job. that in his defense, his job is I'm working in a visual medium and I'm making right. a science fiction epic. So For sure, but it's interesting right. that a, a director who spe- specifically is like I'm not interested or not he's not not interested but I'm not right. largely interested in character or dialogue would pick a move uh, a book like Dune to <laughs> sure <laughs> in, interpret onto the screen where it's not it, it is all character driven and, and politics and intrigue <laughs> in, and dialogue, dialogue and all of that it, it was it, all right, and it Scotty, was all the point. zeros on the check brother yeah <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> he's like of course I'll do your movie 
I know it's no, better he's... than Frank anyway. <laughs> it's a terrible real, accent, by the way. Real quick, Matt. Now, do you think he personified those two feelings with Stilgar and Shani because uh, of ease of telling the story, or was it because uh, just a like a just his choice? I think I I feel like it was just an ease easier way to tell the story of the 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 conflict between the two thought processes was to have one person be like this and then one person be like this. Chani be the the skeptic and having Stilgar yeah. be the completely devout follower. Mm-hmm. Right. No, I, I think I think you're exactly on it. Like I think it was a matter of of ease of like because when you think, I mean, if you think about adapting the book, I think one of the biggest difficulties that jumps to my mind immediately, just at the outset of like, I'm going to adapt Dune, is that the ideas are so big. And it's like, how do I visually tell an idea? Like, mm-hmm, like how do you do that? Like, you know, and it's like, you're going to have to embody that in a character. Um, and so that's why I think like, I think there's criticism to worthy criticism to be made of of Chani and and Jessica and Paul and all the Stilgar all the characters there's some criticism of like well this could have been done differently or better um but I still think overall the overall function of these characters and the way it works for this story and the way it tells this story I think works for me and I I I'm okay with the choices it makes <clears throat> especially on my second viewing um, to to take these really really big ideas and big perspectives of like an entire people or like of how they how they are approaching this whole situation and putting it all into one person to to expound upon and so it's like okay we see from their point of view this is where we're at and we see from this person's point of view where we're at um I think that I think it works man overall I think it works um and I want to you know I want to talk a little bit more about um about jessica and and you know her her kind of struggle to to push forward paul and to get him you know uh to where he needs to be in order to to fight the harkonnens and destroy the emperor and 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 actually accomplish all of their their goals you know i think again like jessica was i think pared down as a character um you know she definitely has more ideas and more concerns in the book that just aren't here in the movie. Um, but I think making her character so much more, <laughs> it's interesting how like in part one, she's kind of, it seems like she's pulling away from the Bene Gesserit. And then in part two, she's like leaning into this, like, no, we're going to use this Bene Gesserit tool and I'm going to manipulate these people and we're going to empower you this way. Um, and, and I think, I think it's an interesting shift for her character for for the movie version of Jessica mm. um that she now in the second one is so much you know more gung ho about like this is how we can actually make Paul emperor <laughs> and and get revenge and do everything we want to do um yeah no I mean I, I'm kind of harping on the same thing at this point but like I I overall overall I'm happy with these choices um, there, I mean, we could get into some more specific ones that I might have issue with, but, but no, like I, I think Jessica, Jessica and Paul's relationship is still one of the, one of the highlights of the, of the movie for me that I think works overall from, from how it functioned in the book to how it functions in the movie. Fair enough. I think, um, I think that, um, there's a lot of ideas in Dune. I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of ideas that are present present in this book um so many things i think probably one of the most interesting aspects i think of the book and uh and i was kind of writing it down because i think it's i think it's the the moral and the ethical and uh, we don't have to get too too uh, into deep, <laughs> the deep waters of philosophy here but i think that you know when frank was writing this book when he wrote this book and he talked about this book his words he said you know, the moral norm is a, is imposed upon the Fremen by their environment, right? So in other words, what they view as right and wrong is imposed upon them by their very environment. And he talks about the ethic being, you know, I think I wrote it down. I think he wrote, uh, the thinking animal uh, can see that the logical consequences of moral actions 
of such and such is his words and maybe i better modify that moral those more those moral quote laws by a higher ethical law right that that the whole premise of the book is based on this idea which is the morality of what we do matters because of how the environment has imposed itself on us we as fremen the ethical is we can stop for a minute and, and think higher and go well is this mm. really really the right thing to be doing versus just what is imposed the moral versus the ethic the i'm testing to see if you're an animal or a human right that whole idea the the hand in the box that's the whole premise of the fucking book that is completely irrelevant i think in the movie um which is fine i think i think tackling the moral versus the ethic in a book <laughs> in a movie is going to be really challenging i'm okay that they kind of skirt around us a little bit um that doesn't i'm not i'm not crazily bothered by that um, one of the things you were saying too, Matt, was you're saying like, you think it, you think it works. You, you're like, I think it works, but you're not like it fucking works and it's awesome. And that's telling <laughs> because I know, I know that that means that you have some reservations about it. And I'm curious about those reservations, but we don't have to get crazy about that. Um, but I think that, yes, I think you're going to have to make some choices. Like if I want to, if I want to, if I want to defend Villeneuve, Villeneuve, you have to make some difficult choices. And, um, and I think if you're going to do that, then what you really want to do, like, it, again, you're talking about, you're talking about plot driven versus character driven. And, and is this a plot driven movie? Is it, is it really about the plot and less about the characters? Um, is this simplification of the characters a problem for you? It, it, it is a little bit for me because I think Cheney. I think we I think we think that if Cheney has a strong POV and can fight that that just makes her a good character. And, and I'm just yeah. kind of bored with that idea. I'm like you have a you 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 go your own way and you have a really scary glare and you can fight. So you're a good character. I don't know about that. I think I think what they're trying to do with Cheney if I'm being honest, if I want to give the movie the benefit of that, I think what they're trying to do with Cheney is they're trying to use her as as a lot of those discussions between Paul and Jessica, they're personifying those discussions and a lot of that thinking in the physical appearance of Cheney. And sadly, it does make her a bit one note, doesn't it? Because if if really Cheney just represents, if if Cheney is a personification of self doubt, then it makes her very one dimensional. Sadly, but I think that's what they're doing instead of. How do we, like Matt's saying, it's a visual medium. Like, how do we fucking, like, imagine this? You know? Go ahead, Scott. Right. Well, I think that they try that, but also her character is in a difficult place the way they put it in the movie because she does love Paul. She does initially not believe who he is, Lisa and Al-Gaib, but she loves him. She doesn't him even like care what, about that. Like, to be clear, yeah. it, that's irrelevant to her, quote, tribe. They don't care about religion, apparently. So. Yeah, she's... She's there. She, you can tell she loves Paul. She, she wants him. She roots for him when he rides the sandworm for the first time. She's so excited that he find, he gets on it and doesn't get murdered. He's like, she's like, yeah, but she still doesn't think he's what he's supposed to be. She doesn't think he's mm -hmm. the Messiah. Mm -hmm. She's just, she's on a smaller scale. She's just supporting the person she has come to care about. Right. A and doing the same <clears throat> thing that you just said, right. showing us a little bit of the, you know, trying to personify this this thought process like maybe maybe I don't feel this way maybe maybe right. he isn't what he's supposed to be and I like yeah, that man. I like that they're they that's a little more multi-layered she's not one note to me a little bit like I think she has a little bit more because she does support Paul she just doesn't support Paul becoming the leader of the Fremen right right because, well, I, I because of quote she, reasons because he's a quote <laughs> outsider yeah yeah you're the daughter I, I of an outsider but she's not forget all that <laughs> one note so much as She's confusing from a motivation standpoint, and it's kind of confusing where Paul's feelings towards her, their relationship, their romantic relationship is very mysterious to me in the movies because yeah. pretty much all she does is talk shit about him. And my mm -hmm. thinking would be, he'd be like, I'll find a different Fremen. <laughs> How about Woman. I'm busy? I got I'm I'm got a lot of shit going on. My father's dead. My house has been destroyed. I killed a man for the first time. I'm having all the shit thrust upon me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know? Could you fucking support me, please? <laughs> she had a hard day like, at work, god damn it. Constantly tearing <laughs> down on 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 what his status, you know, being an outsider and everything that he seems to be attempting to do. I, I mean, I will Yet give I it. Yet I still want to fuck him. 
Yeah, it, it seems more <laughs> it like... It is weird, yeah, it's weird. I, I hate to keep going back to the teenage well, but it seems more like teenage, like, hormonal, like... It, it uh, has, it smacks of that form. for people pushing 30. Yeah, it, it, de it definitely smacks, <laughs> it definitely smacks of, if I pull her hair and, and she's sitting at the desk in front of me, I'll at least get her attention type of bullshit. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't smack of adult relations, I guess is my point. But in defense of the movie, Paul is supposed to be young, right? Um, right. They are supposed to be young, but that said, they don't act like the Fremen, man. I don't know, dude, the Fremen, I'm not saying they're without humor. Um, I'm not saying they're they're but, but the Fremen are, again, they, they, they have almost a mythical fighting quality in the book. They dispatch Sardukar in the desert with ease. They, yeah. and, and, which is and, no and, small and, feat. You know, and they have great, and, and now another thing too about them is that they aren't. They don't have super sophisticated way of fighting. Actually, Paul brings that to them, and I know the movie. Right. The movie has this real reluctance. Like this movie has this real reluctance to show that the Fremen benefit from Paul's presence at all in any way, shape, or form for a reason I just can't, can't quite grasp. Probably because he was only there for like three weeks, according to the movie. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know <laughs> if they're worried about some white savior bullshit, but. But like what one of the things Matt will remind you of is that there's this moment where Gurney is observing the Fremen fighting. He's like, there's something different about these people. Like they're great fighters, but there's a different type of training being implemented here. Or or I think it's Gurney. And they realize, and that's what that's what tips Gurney off, like, holy shit, this makes sense that Paul is among them because now he's bringing and I will give the movie credit on this line here. He's like, you've been fighting the Harkonnen for a long time. We've been fighting them for thousands of years. So maybe yeah. listen to me. I was like, yes, yes, finally, yes. That's great. Step, I'm glad Step in movie, your shit for a little bit. Yes, I like that. <laughs> Instead of him just being like, I, I don't know. I, I, don't like, I don't like the Paul being like, fuck you, mom. I like this girl and we are outsiders. It's like, <laughs> fucking stop, dude. I, it's I, I, it's a little just, bit of movie-itis. It a is. Bit, yeah. It's a little, it's a, and, it, 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 and, it, and I don't love that, but... um. <laughs> But, but I haven't talked a lot about Jessica. I think, I think Jessica gets robbed a little bit. Um, to your point, Matt, I, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think they kind of get distilled into, into more simple characters in the second book, in the second movie, as opposed to in the first movie. And I think with Jessica, you know, I, I'm going to go back to something we started on, but the, the Jameis's funeral thing in the book, there's a funeral for Jameis. They, there's this this really touching moment where all these people come up, and and what I hate another thing is why is he seeing visions of Jameis because he was so close to him? That's dumb. Yeah. Like in the movie, it doesn't yeah. make any sense. They're like, well, that, we uh, talk to me, Jameis. To, talk to me. He's like, it's, talk, it's to me, goose. talk to me, goose, you know? <laughs> Help me, Obi Wan Kenobi. It doesn't make any it, sense. I yeah. It, well, let me just say this to real me, quick. If, if hold on to that thought for just a second. Yeah. Well, I'll you do you, and then I'll talk about the funeral. Well, no, I was just, all I was just gonna say is just the the Jameis thing. Like it felt like the movie trying to make up for the fact that they didn't have the funeral and didn't have the import of what all that meant to Paul right. by just being like, "Well, we'll have more Jameis. <laughs> He'll just be in it more yeah, now. He's his <laughs> and that'll spirit make it animal. Important. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> that guy you murdered. No. So no. Uh, so Jameis's funeral is really good because in the book, what happens is is these people stand up and they say, Jameis did this for me. Jameis pulled me from the rocks and saved me when the Harkonnen did X. James, and you're like, this guy was fucking awesome. And it really <laughs> drives home the fact that, and then, <clears throat> and then Paul is overwhelmed in this and cries. And when Paul cries, they freak the fuck out because they go, he gives his water to the dead. And this is significant to the Fremen. It really matters to them. And then what Jessica does is Jessica kind of gives him a, a little kinjal in the ribs by saying, how did you like killing another man? And it's very critical in the book when she says that because she doesn't want Paul to get used to killing because Jessica mm. doesn't want the fucking jihad, you know? And I think she's like, how does it feel? Like she doesn't want Paul to be comfortable in killing. And she's really upset about, she's happy that he doesn't die to Jameis, happy he, he wins the fight, but she doesn't want him to get comfort in the feeling of killing a man. And that's a really big moment in the book. And in the fact when Paul cries, and that's why when, when they show all the poured out, pour one out from literally pour my homies out, when they show that pour my <laughs> homies out scene, 
and Jessica cries, and Selgar's like, don't cry for the dead. I'm like, fuck this movie. I was so mad. That shit pissed me off because I was like, but wait a minute. He shed, she's shedding tears for the dead. There's no greater honor. I mean, this is the same guy that spit at the feet of Leto to show what it mattered to give up your water. And I was like, don't waste your tears on the dead. And I was like, that's just, that's like Han shooting first to me. It's just soup. It's stupid. Yeah, and it really undermines right. the Stilgar character. And I don't, and whatever, it took this long for it to come up. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I do, but I do think that Jessica gets a little, uh, gets a little short, a little shorthanded part of this whole thing because she, she ends up becoming the Reverend Mother. So, do you want to talk about Jessica's becoming to replace? I think her name is Romalo. Do you want to talk about that scene? Oh, the the old Reverend Mother scene. Yeah. yeah. Um. To be honest, like. That that's one of the few scenes where I'm like it it works it makes sense I get it and it, I feel like it's capturing what it captures in the book but but I was I was hoping I almost was I almost knew it was going to be impossible to be honest but I was hoping for something more with the moat the yeah, the no, the, the subatomic moat that they realize they are and can mm -hmm. affect things and I was like that's such I mean. It's such a fucking cool part of the book. It, it's it's really fucking cool. It's insane. Um, but even when I was reading it in the book, I was like, how are they going to fucking we do said, this? We, <laughs> we, like, I just listened to that episode, and we were like, good luck, dude. Good luck with this fucking scene, because <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you're going to do. I'm going to give him a pass on that. Yeah, um, same, same. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. give him a pass on that. I'm glad. I'm sure he's happy to know we're giving him a pass over here. <laughs> oh, thank God. God. Well, he laughs oh, to God. the bank. Oh, all he counts like, is millions. <laughs> Yeah, he's a <laughs> fucking idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, um, oh. no, I think, I think, um, I do, the only thing I do think, the only thing I don't like is like, remember that when Jessica becomes the Reverend Mother over there, um, she is doing it because Romalo is dying. So mm -hmm. she finds out Romalo is dying and they have to move the siege because they're nomadic. They don't just stay in one spot. And Romalo is not going to be able to make the journey. She's going to die. So Jessica, after talking to Stilgar, agrees. She doesn't. He doesn't threaten to throw her out to the desert like he does in the movie. <laughs> she agrees that she's going right? to do this, and it's a bit scary for her. And before she does it, they name Chani Sayadina in the book. So Chani, should anything happen to to Jessica, Chani will step in. To the point where instead of sitting on the outside of the cave, going that dumb bitch is that dumb white bitch is drinking worm juice she's literally <laughs> pouring the water of life into her mouth in the book squeezing it in there because the ritual matters to cheney cheney's just again that they she's completely just she's very different <laughs> she's very different in the book you know it's more tragic if cheney is the dutiful like yes i'm gonna i'm gonna and then to get that shit that she gets in the end you'll be like fuck that sucks and she can still be a strong and interesting character you know but i think I mean, whatever, like, like, like we were saying, she represents, maybe she represents Paul's doubt and that's how you want to play it out on the big screen. Fine, whatever. But, um, but yeah, she becomes the, she becomes a reverend mother and that's, that's pretty cool. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big fucking deal. That scene, I think there were 5,000 people in the book at that ceremony oh, as no. opposed to yeah, a tent no, full no. of people laughing at her on the outside being like, well, she's drinking worm juice. What a dumb dumb. <laughs> it just like that that just undermines the Fremen to me, that kind of writing. I just think I'm like, meh, I don't love it. Yeah. But um but I mean I also like that the the, the old Reverend Mother is just like, Oh fuck, she's preggers. She didn't tell yeah, us. They didn't know I'm in the dead. book either. That was sick. Yeah. Um also another thing again, I, I find myself saying a lot of things I don't like and I'm sorry. But um I don't <laughs> like that Romalo goes drink and uses the voice. That doesn't that it, sort of defeat the purpose of her willingly? She you know, willingly drinks mother? the water of life and puts yeah, her life. She on the doesn't line. want to, but she's like, yeah. I guess. And then Cheney squirts it in there. But in the <laughs> book, if you're like commanding her, like drink, okay, like, okay, no, she has no choice now. She has no Why don't choice you pick now. Any of the other Fremen, then you know what I mean? Once, if you can use the voice on them, <laughs> why you got to pick her? Yeah, well, she's Benny Gesserit trained, I guess. Yeah, true. The begs the question: Are the other ones? I don't even know. But um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, taking that, taking well, that. Well, it's interesting that you say because I don't, I don't remember that part of the book too specifically. If if Jessica had died, 
from the water of life didn't make it through the transition you're saying cheney was was next in line i don't but know if he's next in line to be a reverend mother but she was made Sayadina so she could be some sort of spiritual leader in the event of jessica's death in in it oh. in the Sayadina takes place in the ritual that's about the extent of my memory on that okay because mm -hmm. um, she didn't have any bene Gesserit training no right no okay no the bene Gesserit are pretty selective about who they train and that stuff um actually paul having some bene Gesserit training was a really big deal as a male yeah yeah and, yeah. and men training upon. too yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's a mentat he's a mentat fremen bene Gesserit. so good luck stopping that <laughs> <laughs> or he's just somebody that people laugh at. I don't know. Yeah, in a tent. Take <laughs> your pick. But, uh... <laughs> Dude, I I want to I want to shift gears a little bit. I want I want to talk about a scene that I think is fucking excellent. Uh Paul riding the sandworm it's for the first so time. So good. Dude, I don't think it could have been done better. Like I I, I was like it. that 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 nailed it. It did everything I could have wanted and more um, yep. from that scene. I mean, Paul, Paul running on the top of edge of the dune towards the big <laughs> as fucking, it collapses, like as it's just collapsing under the weight of this worm as it's going by and just it's running awesome. and jumping down onto it. I was like, that's fucking awesome. But that's exactly <laughs> that what Villeneuve is cool. going to do so perfectly. And that's why shit. there are part, yeah, yeah there are shit. parts of this movie that are great because it is visual. And, and yeah. it's something that almost, and this is going to be weird to say because the book is so great, but it's something that's a little bit lost in the book that almost requires a visual medium to show the epic scale of what he's yes. doing. Yes. How big this fucking thing is, how much it's right. affecting the landscape that he's in. And when he makes that jump, he might as well be jumping off the fucking Empire State Building. No shit. To, 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 to <laughs> grab onto this giant fucking worm and ride it which is crazy and and matt it's a great point it's just it's such a amazing scene amazingly well done and it's exactly yeah. why villeneuve in some ways is the perfect choice for this right and, and you know I'll, I'll i'll go a step further although i think you kind of did it might be portrayed on film better than in the book you know you know, villeneuve's ability to express this visually may be better than frank's ability to write it i don't know i'm, I'm willing to entertain <laughs> that notion right yeah um to give villeneuve credit i mean he really deserves credit for this scene for sure I, he deserves credit for all of this stuff and he's getting it i mean he's getting the money he's getting the next picture he's getting the credit he villeneuve is promptly being sucked off there's only a couple of curmudgeonly <laughs> book douche lists like me that are trying to ruin it for everybody <laughs> uh, so there's the, the, you know he's, he'll, he'll be just fine despite what i fucking say about him um but no it, there are a lot of i will say this one of my one of my one of my uh, one of my criticisms of of Dune one was more of a compliment for Blade Runner twenty forty nine, and that was a lot of people talking about how visually compelling Dune one is. How come we're not talking about Blade Runner in the same way? I think it's more visually compelling than Dune one because it's more colorful, um, and a yeah, lot of that cyberpunk shit in twenty forty. And by the way, on record, loving that movie might be as good as the first one. That's a Villeneuve picture. So there you go. I sucked his cock for you. <laughs> But I think he, uh, I think, I think it's, I think it maybe even overshadows Dune 1 in terms of its visual spectacle. But in yeah. Dune 2, there are, that, that worm riding scene is one of my favorite scenes by him. Um, another being the shootout in, <laughs> the shootout in Sicario at the border. It's just so well done. <laughs> it's so brief and brutal. Um, but no, I, I, I really think it's great. There's a lot of great moments of, of shooting in this where he decides Dude. that he wants to show the dunes, pull the camera back a little, show people sitting up on places, and the action is fucking sick. Dude. Um, I remember with Brian, when we watched... So one thing I didn't see, I we didn't see... I'm going to tell you how many minutes exactly. Ten minutes of the movie we missed. So, put, so I finally saw them fighting those Harkonnen troops in the beginning. And just making short work of them and calling the thumper and having them just get scooped up. That is Fremen oh, shit yeah. to me. When the Fremen yeah. kill those Harkonnen, they put a pile <clears throat> of their bodies, they drain their water, and then they call the worm, and then they move on and go, that's Fremen. Mm -hmm. they don't, 
they're not talking that's, shit. That's their SOP mouths are right sh- there. Their mouth is shut and they're just killing shit. And that's yeah. sick. Like these um these these lines for lines sake in 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 the stuff I've already hearkened upon. Um, about the about the you know stupid lady drinking the worm and blah 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 and the ha 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 giggle giggle and isn't Stilgar just a silly old man, um you know <laughs> whatever. But these moments of them crouched up on fucking uh, cliff faces on escarpments, looking down, skeptically observing, moving silently, attacking, ambushing, being smart, all of that stuff is phenomenal. The attacks so good. that like Dude, Villeneuve yes. gets that absolutely fucking right. And I got to give credit where credit is due on that kind of shit, because to do anything else would just be me being dishonest. And the that, first that, let's fucking go. We get out of Dean is when those fucking machine guns from the helicopters. <laughs> when they're shooting the Fremen, the I sound, go the sound. I, it, it's, it's that moment where I'm like, I still want the allies to take the beach but can we just watch the MG42 do work just for a second? <laughs> you know, because I it's don't so hate s- America. I just loved it. Guys. It's just so sick that <laughs> tapping the dude's helmet, yeah, tell him to look over there, and you're like, that is a marvel of technology. I can't even hate it. <laughs> and that's how I felt when some of the Fremen got wasted. I'm like, that is nasty. That <laughs> Imperium weaponry at its finest. <laughs> But I do, but but the action there is in Brian is absolutely. Right. I remember going, "Fuck, yeah, this is nuts." I remember doing that because it was awesome. And when they got the, the the moment where the harvester arms are going tink, 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 and coming down, oh, and they're yeah. running between them for cover, and she shoulder rockets the thing. Excellent. I love all that stuff. Ripping, the, just taking out the, the ornithopter, and then you know that's how he gets his Usul name, and they hug and kiss on the thing, and. And then shortly thereafter is is really that that great worm scene, um, right before I think uh, Raban gets it. <laughs> they, they go after Raban's guys, <laughs> but no, that fucking shit is awesome, right? I remember yeah. in the first movie when the Sardaukar car just floated down, ooh, all quiet, and they landed. I'm <laughs> like, dude, the Sardaukar car fucking killers. <laughs> and again, that's another mirror image. The Sardaukar car are like the Fremen. Right, remember the fucking the dudes that doing their shit, and the guys putting the blood on their forehead. That their their culture is like we are steeped in combat, and the fremen yeah. are steeped in combat. You know the the way they have to live out there, and they're yeah. these two almost mythical fighting forces colliding. It's Wasn't the, the the planet where the Sardaukar are trained is specifically chosen because it's fucking difficult living? It's hard. Exactly, it's hard to live on. They God put the Fremen Spartan birth, you know. God put the God created Arrakis to test the faithful. I think is the opening of one of the <clears> chapters, <throat> and it's the same yeah. shit with Seleucus Secundus. It's just this. In fact, I think that's where Shaddam ends up. I think he ends up taking his house. I think Seleucia was a House Carino's seat originally. I because I, I think oh. Seleucus Secundus come from the House Carino. I I don't I might be wrong about that, but I'm certain that <laughs> I'm certain that once Paul ousts his ass, he goes back to Seleucus Secundus. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's they're <clears throat> they're no joke too. But the but the Fremen are also no joke, and and the Harkonnen troops are just way out of their element. I do oh, like yeah. seeing the like I don't mind seeing the Harkonnen troops get beat up a little, but there are moments where I do feel a little of the outlaw Josie Wales effect, where I'm like. Are any of these bad guys going to present a threat at all for the good guys? Because they seem to just be steamrolling all of them at, at a moment's notice. You know, right? Um, here's a change that I like. Here's a change that I like. Um, the Laz weapons. Oh yeah, I'm okay with that. There's no real. It's mostly uh, mostly Mala pistols, Mala weapons, and projectiles. I think the Laz pistols and the Laz guns were cool. I think. I think. I think. Frank sort of hand waved that stuff away by saying that if the uh, laser hits the Holtzman field generator, you could cause an atomic explosion or nothing could happen. It's random. So I think that's why he had las guns, like kind of a rare thing and it was more projectile based, but the way, the way they, and I think Brian, you said it in the theater, you're like the way the beam is just constant and just cuts across the fucking yeah. harvesters is awesome. Awesome. So cool. that's, can we all I just collectively sigh relief that they didn't have weirding modules? 
Thank God. <laughs> mm, yeah, dude. <laughs> mm, yeah, dude. your name is a killing word. <laughs> the only good line from, from that the best line that Lynch had was that because I don't think it's said yeah. in Dune. My name is a killing word is a great fucking line. Yeah. But that goofy, mm, yeah, <laughs> when they fucking, I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, it makes sense. It makes probably more sense than Laz Guns, but uh, the Laz Guns look sick. I really That's like cool. them. I think they're used to great effect. And yeah, I just, I like when a laser weapon takes on the actual, like, physical properties of what a laser is, which is, it either goes through it or it doesn't. And if it goes through it, it keeps fucking going. It is Absolutely. a beam of light. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that all of that stuff again i i i have plenty of plenty of good to say about that stuff um you know we kind of touched upon fade fighting in the uh in the pit but it was in for it was important for the movie to make fade dangerous you know to make us yeah. be like oh shit what's gonna happen when, when these guys fucking when these guys collide what's gonna be the and fate of the, our man one thing i think you know and it's it, i think it's actually kind of difficult for like the four of us to keep in mind because we're all we all know dune so well we've seen the movies we've seen lynch's movie we've read the book like for us we we already it feels inevitable because we know it but i think part two dune part two does a really good job of of setting up fade to be the encounter with paul like Agreed. like like you were saying dean like it makes him dangerous and like from the second you see fade for the first time and he, you know <laughs> i mean shit how disposable are fucking Harkonnen women? Jesus it Christ. Is, like, that, you just that, fucking that, that, test that my might knife. be a bit goofy. That might be a bit goofy. <laughs> it's a little insane. That's goofy, yeah. but, but his training in, in the portrayal... Who, who's the actor? I'm sorry. Austin Butler. He's good. He, yeah, he, he, plays, good. he plays a good fade. I'm, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. There, there's departures of fade from the book, which are silly but I'm not going to spend a ton of time on him. I will mention them, but, but his portrayal of this version and how he is an imminent threat is good. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sold on fade. Um, go ahead, Scotty. The only problem I had was the goddamn woo Woochie cap they put on him. Because he didn't shave his head in this, and you can tell it's fake. His head yeah, is big, giant, massive. It's big. He, yeah. he looks like leader from Marvel. Yeah. You know, <laughs> dude with the tall head. Yeah, <laughs> one of those, I was just, one of those goofy Jedi on the council, the fucking tall headed guy. Oh yeah, the big, the big eggplant head. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just couldn't get over it because I'm like, uh, I know it's actually done very well. It's, it's almost seamless, but I'm like, his head is too big. His head is too big. I couldn't get bit. over it, yeah. especially because yeah, you don't hear like a there. line or anything. It's just. It, there's a physical size problem that you can't get away from. <laughs> and they routinely have him chin low, scouring, scouring yeah. too. So his, his head's pointing deeper at the camera, you know? <laughs> I can't it's, see the lens flare. Oh, wait, no, it's not a Nolan film. It's just his head. Uh, so bouncing one, off his forehead. One thing I... <laughs> that's how he gets him in the end, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking he he just just and an an angle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You just see Gurney be like, go for his head. It's fucking huge. Go for the head. <laughs> go for the dome. <laughs> Swing high and often. But no, it's uh, <laughs> with, uh, I think with, uh, I think, so So in the book, a couple, just a, a couple things. Again, less egregiously annoying, but I will point them out. So in the book, Fade, in the book, the whole drugging of the guy is actually Fade's idea to implicate the slave master as a knock on the baron it's it's kind of complicated I forgot but about I, that. <laughs> but, but basically what happens in the book is um they they give him a word scum they give him a word they give him like a they program this guy so through for Hawat, who's not in this at all they he dropped actually, him deleted they him. dropped him yeah. from because he becomes yeah. like subservient to them for a while for his death. I wish he had been in it, but I'm glad that he didn't have a cat that he had to milk for medicine. <laughs> for you know, like if I was going to have that one or, or the was other. That Piter? I don't remember. That was Piter. That was Piter. No, yeah. no, no. That's, it's Th Thufir, it in, Thufir? In, in, in Lynch's movie. Thufir gets captured. Um, and instead yes, of. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the book, they're, yes. they're using him to replace Piter. And right. they kind of, they manipulate him because they're fucking geniuses in the book and they're not in the movies. Yeah. But either in Lynch's version or in Villeneuve's version. But in Lynch's version, they capture Thufir. They basically just 
They hide him in the basement with a cat in a cage that he has to milk <laughs> to get medicine right. for a poison that he has imbibed. Right, that's right. That's how the Baron manipulates <laughs> Stufer. He's poisoned him slowly, mm-hmm. and then he feeds him the antidote to keep him loyal. Um, and he and he uses, I believe, Thufir. Yeah, one thing they completely struck was that there was doubt about one of the treacherous things that the the cunning Baron does is they put doubt in they put doubt in people's head that Jessica may have been the betrayer of House Atreides. That doesn't come up in the movie yeah. at all. And then when no. Hawat confronts her, he's like, I might have to, I might kill her right now. And she's like, something's off on him. And that's a great, great moment in the book. But yeah, in this, and also Gurney, I believe when yeah, he first Gurney has joins issue. back up, uh, yeah. he doesn't know that, it, that UA was the, was the traitor. And Paul yes. already knows Paul, Paul and everybody already knows this, but Gurney had no idea. Right. So I believe he, when he sees Jessica, he's like about to fucking kill her. Oh, maybe it's, maybe I'm confusing Gurney and, and, ha- and Hawat then. Yeah. And Paul is like, no, 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 because both happen. Ha- okay. uh, Hawat, it's before Leto dies. Okay, he's yeah, talking right. to her on Arrakis, I think, and he's yeah, that's he's a like, great scene. He's thinking to himself, like, I, I might have to, I might have to kill her and then explain this to my Duke. Yeah, and I don't know how I'm going to do that. Yeah, but no, when Gurney gets back into the fold with the Fremen, when he, because at first he just sees Paul and the Fremen. Oh yeah, he attacks her. Stuff. He puts the knife on her. Right. That's and right. Paul's that's right. like, dude, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, the fade thing is, um, there's a one one of the things about like them just sort of mindlessly slashing people's throats is it is a little silly. It it does it doors it sort of reduces them a little bit, um, right? But I think what happened in the in the book is that fade tried to assassinate the Baron by putting <laughs> the, the book movie doesn't want to get into this. Probably not a terrible change to be honest with you, but um, <laughs> he embeds in a slave boy for the Baron. <laughs> He embeds in his thigh a needle that's going to poison him when he touches the child's inner thigh. So, yay. But um, probably a good idea to take that out of the movie. But um, the <laughs> yeah. Baron, of course, the Baron, of course, discovers this and then summons Fade. And Fade thinks, I think he's going to kill me. And then he's like, he's like, stop with these childish attempts on my life. This is stupid. He's like, I will retire. You will become the head of the house. Just listen to me. You, you're ambitious, but you have no cunning. I'm going to teach you how to be cunning. It's cool. It's like the Baron doesn't take the assassination attempt personally. He uses it. And that's what I mean by that kind of, that that could have been a cool thing to add into the movie, like to see how how cunning they are. And then um, he's like, but for your punishment, we're going to go into the slave quarters. And I'm going to watch you kill the slave girls. And Fade's like, oh, okay. fuck. And Slade's like, Fade's not a psychopath. He's like, I don't want to do that, but I also don't want to die. So I guess I'm going to do that. He's like, I'm going to watch you strangle. So go, let's go. Right. That's your punishment. <laughs> and he's like, "Fuck," because he liked her kind of like as a slave as much as you can like your slave. He liked his property. It's like you know, <laughs> but um, but daddy, but I, that's my favorite toy. <laughs> so so <laughs> that's Papa, cool. That's a cool strangling. moment. Yeah, that's a cool moment in the in the book. But but no, the um, in in I think it's okay the way the movie does this. Um, the movie changes this whole thing to where the. The change here is that the Baron has made this guy not drugged, right? So he can yeah. show that fate is capable. Because one thing about the Harkonnen fighting pits is that it's always a, a predetermined outcome, and everyone knows that the other person is always drugged. And it's really just this execution. It's like a spectacle of execution. And in this moment, everyone is sort of collectively gasping, like, wow, this guy's not drugged. Oh, my God, Fade's amazing. Like, that was the point, that Fade was to be right. elevated in their eyes. And I think that's a cool way. I think that's a departure from the book that really works for the context of the movie. I'm okay I with agree. that. Yeah, I yeah. think that's good. Yeah. Um, and, the, and he's like, and when he confronts the Baron, the Baron's like, I, I, who are you today? You're fucking, you overcame. I just hooked you up. So well, exactly. are you and kidding that, me? And that's cool. Like that's, <laughs> that, I, I'll, I'll give the movie that. I think that's really awesome. Um, I like that. That's good shit. So I, while I think by and large, it's a little bit of a miss. I do appreciate that. I do appreciate that part of what they did with the Harkonnen. Um, but we haven't really talked too much about Gurney. Do you guys want to talk about Gurney and, and his whole thing? Um, I'm sad we didn't get to see Stabon Tuek, but, that would have been oh, cool. Like yeah, that's the smuggler, like he's rolling with. Yeah. <laughs> and um 
but uh, he not. Go ahead. I was going to say I like I like Gurney in this. I I do. <clears throat> The only, the only problem I wouldn't even call it a problem. It's just a slight disappointment uh, with Gurney for me in this movie was him finally facing Raban. Yeah, that was like two seconds. It was like yeah. they he sees him and we have that great moment of him coming up the stairs and and Raban turns to see him and they're like, oh shit, this is it, mm -hmm. and he's just like pop pop. Bop. <laughs> and he's knife just in the dead. Throat. And I'm like, yeah, knife in the throat. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, well, sadly. Glad he got him, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't. And I think, I don't even think Raban dies by Gurney's hand. I think Raban is killed by Fremen. No, no, no. I, well, hold on. I might be conflating Lynch's movie. You are. It, he's not He's not executed by the Emperor. I think he might be executed by... You mean Paul? In Shadam Lynch's movie... Shaddam kills him and has his head like on a platter when I don't when the Baron arrives. You know I don't remember. I'm having a real brain fart on Raban. I thought Raban was killed by <laughs> Fremen, but I might be wrong about maybe either killed or executed by Fremen. Sort of after all this shit, I think once Stilgar takes over. But I might be wrong about all that. I don't really remember Raban's fate. Um, I think Scott's actually looking it up. I'm but, trying um, to find it here. Yeah, <laughs> I I really like um, Josh. Is that his name? Josh Brolin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I always confuse Josh and James. Um, I really like Brolin. I think he's fucking awesome. He's um, got such a presence about him. He really he, does. He and, and I, I think Gurney's just a really good character. And um, yeah, and I think that, you know, I think I think there are times where he's like well, the Atomics and and Shane, he's like, oh no, not that. You know, it's you know some of <laughs> how did you how did you guys oh, feel i actually i really enjoyed that they have what is it called dean the the instrument that he plays again the gurney play, the balaset dude i love the inclusion of the balaset that too. was that was perfect because it was so quick and he was just like oh Mad. my still suits full of piss <laughs> just singing away my duke is long dead i'm really fucking thirsty I hope Cheney doesn't annoy me. Purr, 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 purr. I guess he's gonna. Sorry, that's maybe my song. No, um, uh, I think uh, I think I do like the inclusion of the balsa because he he in the book he's kind of like when he sings he's singing nice you know it's very it's very Lord of the Rings shit singing yeah and in this he's just like fuck your mother power chords like I'm mad everyone's dead it's pretty cool you know I do like the inclusion uh, of the balsa. I was going to say, Rapan is slain and beheaded by the Fremen populace of Arakeen. Right. Oh, that's okay. right. That's nice. what I was remembering. So Gurney Same. never gets his revenge. He does nope. not. <laughs> not in that sense, but he does uh, participate in a lot of this killing, murder. Maybe better than having the two second uh, premature ejaculation of just murdering the fuck out of him without getting any kind of pleasure out of it. Yeah, they, they really <laughs> did. They, they, they probably have. All, it's funny. Oddly enough, I would probably say the, the 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 most egregious problem with any of the characters is Raban, even though it's less matter matter. Well, I don't know. I think I have a lot of problems with Stilgar. I think Stilgar was one of my favorite characters in the book, and uh, and I really because I've laid into the movie quite a bit. I don't want to go on a whole other thing about Stilgar, but I think that that was an unfortunate miss for me with Stilgar. Um, mm -hmm. I think. Um, you know, it's funny. I remember uh, in the worm riding scene in the book, after Paul dismounts, Stilgar's like, "Pretty good, but here's where you fucked up." You know, he's <laughs> not that. like he's not like, oh, 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 "Yes, Lucien Al Gaib, shoot your water life into my face." He's like, "You did it, <laughs> but here's where you might be careful next time because if you do this again, this might be bad for you." You got you lucky, know, kid. Yeah, he there. There is some of that in Stilgar still, but um, but no, it's uh. Yeah, back back what we were saying a minute ago. Gurney is 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 pretty cool. I, you know, there's Gurney doesn't have a ton to do. He's he's not in it a lot, you know. And and when he is, yeah. he rules. I, I don't know. I like Brolin. I think he's fucking cool. Right, right. No, I think again, this is another time where the performance really sells this role, and I think Brolin just nails it. Like he's just really good. He had, like you said, Brian. Like mm -hmm. he just got a really strong presence and. And I think it's just very believable, his relationship with Paul. Like, 
you know, the, the, the fact that, I mean, they even make reference to it early in the movie when, when I think it's Chani asking him, like, how do you, who did t- teach you to fight like this? Like, how yeah. do you know how to fight? It's and he's like, oh, my old, my old masters, you know, my old lords mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, and he's talking about Gurney. And like, we did the movie, you know, and Villeneuve's Duncan. movie. Yeah, yeah, and Duncan. Um, but Villeneuve's movies do set this up pretty well, I think, of giving us that great scene in the first movie of the training scene where yeah, Gurney's talking to Paul. Scene. It's a really good scene, and I think it captured pretty well from the book. Um, this and one? so it's it's brutal, brutal. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but no, when he comes back, it, it definitely has some power to it, and it's cool to see. I mean, I loved their reunion scene uh, yes. when he actually like sees him for the first time. Yeah. Like that was yeah, really yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Well earned, well earned, and you feel for him because the small times you saw him together, there felt like a you know he's it was his mentor, mm-hmm. a- and he, he calls him like young pup or something like that, and then runs yeah, over and right gives him right like, from the book. Yep, <clears throat> yeah, that's good shit. Ooh, if you. If you, if you don't feel anything with that, you're not alive. Because I was like covered in goosebumps, <laughs> dude. One hundred percent. I think like they did scene. a great job with with that with Duncan in the first movie, and then with Gurney in the second movie, of of having yeah. this relationship with. And they they largely don't have him have a relationship with Fufir like he does in the book. Right. But um, yeah. But it, Duncan, you you feel that relationship, and and it's really good um, between Duncan and Paul in the first movie. And I remember, I, I remember watching the trailer for the first movie, and I, I just like love the part where he's like, "Ha ha ha, my boy!" and like picks him up, and like thinking that that was super cool, and being like, "Yeah, I fucking love the relationship between those yeah. two. And and um, and then like you said, Scott, this, it's just it's well earned in this. You, it, Gurney has a long hiatus where he's he's not there, and when he when he comes back in, you feel the love between those two characters, and I'll credit the actors and. <laughs> And I guess I'll credit Villeneuve <laughs> for his directing of a scene of dialogue. No <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, that, that stuff worked. There's a couple of, like I said, I don't, I, I think a lot of times I spent watching this movie just kind of going, wow, holy cow. But outside of a couple of scenes you just mentioned, I didn't find myself overly emotionally sort of like tipped i don't know if you guys did um Mm -hmm. i was like this is super impressive to look at and to watch but like like you said like i was like when gurney dispatches rabban i was like "Ah, fuck in 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 stuff like that i I guess what i'm trying to say is i didn't feel like there's so many moments and, and here's another adaptation how about lord of the rings Oof, yeah yeah so there's a lot of moments in that where i emotionally feel I get a lot of goosebumps watching those movies. A lot of times I wish I could say the same about this one. I just don't. And I don't know why. Hmm. And I'm not saying Damn, that makes it bad, <clears throat> but, but I think that's really... just true. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Cause I, mean, I honestly putting those two together in my head, kind of juxtaposing the Lord of the Rings and Dune. You're right. Like I would say one of the biggest differences that jumps out at me, as far as the movies go uh, between Dune and Lord of the Rings is that Lord of the Rings it's impossible not to feel attached to the characters mm-hmm. and feel in love with so many of the characters and the hobbits. And, and it, it really does, it touches you. Um, and I feel like, and I, and I feel like I can say this from my first viewing, especially of Dune part two, I, as much as I was like fucking impressed and just like, wow, like what a fucking movie. Right. I didn't feel emotionally pulled as, as hard. It was it, like, like you were saying, it was like the power of spectacle and the incre- incredible score and just the, the, the look of the thing and everything was so great. But I kind of walked out like, damn, I'm super impressed, but I, I'm not like, I don't, I, I don't feel, I don't really yeah. feel. Absolutely. And, and I felt better on my second viewing mm-hmm. and I have a bit of a th- slight theory as to why, um, and I'd, I'd be curious to see what you guys think of this because, <clears throat> you know, we, we've been talking about, you know, the the nature of this story and how it's been changed from the book uh, and and what, what kind of story are we getting in the film and how are we connecting with, with the same material in this different kind of context with some different choices made. And one of the things that I think the movie does that 
you know, and we, we talked about this a little earlier on about how like Paul is not a good guy, that whole thing, like, and how this movie kind of leans into that a little more of like, no, we're going to like really make it so that like Paul is not the quote unquote hero that there's, it's more complicated than that. It's, but I don't even know. I, I, even though he says that, even though Villeneuve says that, I don't know if he succeeded in that. Dude, does anybody, I was going to wa- say, does anybody watch this read- and go, Paul's a bad guy? Right, I've read so much stuff about this, like anti-hero or, or him straight up just being a bad guy. And I'm like, when right. I watch that movie, I don't no. see that at all. No. I think that he's still the hero. Of course. And I mean, I mean <laughs> yeah. it, 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 knowing what's to come, at the end, there's a little bit of that kind of like, oh shit, they're about to start their fucking jihad. Um, I, I'm well, sorry I, we jumped on you, Matt, but I think I think this is one of the problems with using Channing's the voice of doubt i don't know if she's mm. good enough to represent that idea and and i think part of what makes me emotionally i don't feel anything the only thing i feel towards with cheney is the part where he's like i'm gonna go marry her and i was like that poor chick i felt bad for her in that moment <laughs> but otherwise when she's just always glowering and they keep showing these reaction shots of her mad at Paul's journey I'm like is this supposed to be the doubt because it's just not it's just it just seems like harumphness to me you know yeah, I'm sorry it, we, we kind of jumped all over Matt's fucking go ahead, go ahead. Apple, <laughs> up thing here, well no I mean the only other thing I was going to say is that I kind of I came at it on my second viewing with some of that in mind and was like uh, like how how do I feel about this movie how mm-hmm. is this movie going to make me feel especially on a second viewing and I do think that if you if you view it from the point of view that Paul's success in destroying the Harkonnens and becoming emperor is going to lead to something terrible. Like if you keep that in mind, if you, if you're really just like, okay, so his success here, he, he fucking gets the Baron just, you know, takes over the emperor um, and takes on the great houses at the very end. But this is all leading to, kind of the worst possible outcomes for the universe, for the people of the universe or whatever. And I feel like what, what started to affect me more was thinking about it from that point of view. And then the score, because the score, the music, when Paul is in, when it's like, we're in the final scene of like Paul and the Fremen, like rolling in on the emperor Mm -hmm. and showing up, the music is scary. And like yeah. foreboding. It's yeah. not like triumphant, like, yay, Paul's the winner. It's just like fucking here it comes. Here's the unstoppable force that is now unleashed. Um, and that the feeling of like more like foreboding or like dread is a little bit more what I got by the end of this movie on the second viewing. And I and I like that. I actually kind of like that. I was like, dude, it feels it feels scary the idea of what's gonna happen next. Um, like, like it's going to get worse in some sense. And I think the movie does a good job of emphasizing, like Paul is succeeding, Paul is winning, but what are going to be the massive consequences of this, uh, as we go forward. And like, when I, when I started viewing it from that angle, it definitely, I I felt a little more from the movie. I I definitely had a little more of like a, a, a feeling of like, wow, this is really, it, it, it's 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 incredible what's happening, but also like what are the what are the massive consequences of what we are seeing that we haven't seen yet, um, and that kind of I don't know it stirred me a little bit more I guess I would say interesting. How about you guys? Did you well, did you in I other mean, words did you felt like yeah what I did think, you guys I, feel yeah what did everybody feel like because I, I I almost um, I, I I there's a difference like I go to a museum and I look at some beautiful piece of art and I and I and I get shivers. Or I can look at the amazing construction of a building and go, wow, what a mathematical success. But I don't really feel anything. It's, it's, uh, it's weird. It's almost like I'm trying to compare like that experience. I'm not sure if I got the right words for it. But, but there is, you, you know, I think, I don't know how I'm trying to say this. It, it's, it's, it's feeling something's emotional impact on you versus understanding academically that it's an achievement. I no. academically see the success of Dune too, but I'm not sure I feel it. Mm-hmm. Best way for me to say it. Whereas I get that. Lord of the Rings was the perfect combination of both. I was like, not only is this crazy impressive, but I'm feeling a lot watching this. You know, yeah. well, getting back to the Lord of the Rings in general, I think that one of the, the instant comparisons that I'll draw is that 
if you watch the Lord of the Rings films and you watch the two Dune films that are adaptations of books, um, they both cut a ton of stuff just mm -hmm. for the reason that it doesn't work on film or directorial Time. choices, timing, whatever the case may be. It's far more, and I can speak as having read both Lord of the Rings and Dune and coming in and watching it, that the things about Dune that are left out are far more distracting than the things in Lord of the Rings. Um, oh, there's another, speaking, there, you know what? There's another adaptation where they changed one of the female protagonists in Arwen. Just like Chaney's, very different, right? It's interesting. Sorry, continue. I was just having a revelation. Yeah. Um, speaking to the emotional content of it, Lord of the Rings is a very character-driven series of movies. And, we, you know, we've expounded upon it plenty at this point that Villeneuve, He's, a, he's all about that visual spectacle. And I, I think that your point about describing, like, respecting the, like, mathematics of architecture and, like, how it was put together. And we, and you know, we were talking about production design. Like, the mm -hmm. production is we're all massively on on impressive. That. Right. Um, in terms of the emotional beats, you know, we, we, we mentioned a couple of them where, like, I, I, I think that, you know, the reunion with Gurney is, is cool, but not all that moving when i when i really Doesn't think blow about you it away. no but it's i cool. think that scott so probably, move scott <laughs> yeah, I, yeah i liked it i liked it but like I liked it. like you guys say i wasn't like i wasn't like sam going through the water to frodo in the boat saying i'm coming like i don't care and <laughs> i'm gonna come with you and almost drowning you know like oh, it's Ar that. Ar aragorn it with the dying boromir i mean like, yeah that's that the pinnacle is... But that's but that's also a death scene. I was trying to think of something not so <laughs> right. You know, right. that's like the pinnacle of emotional content. But I, I, you, you mentioned it, Dean, and I actually do think that it is a pivotal moment in the movie where I did it, it did actually get, you know, emotional for me. Where where Paul, you know, walks past Cheney and he says, uh, essentially, no matter what's about to happen, remember that I love you always. Or or mm -hmm. I don't remember exact. The I will love you the to the, the my uh, the the last breath to or something. My last, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, when he says that, and then you know, two minutes later, he proposes this plan. He proposes, <laughs> he proposes <laughs> this plan that he's going to take <laughs> the empire, and he's going he's going to take he's yeah. going to take the seat of power, and he's going to take Irulan and and marry her, and mm -hmm. like the look on Cheney's face. That that was an emotional beat for me that worked for the movie, and then it does go right into like Matt was talking about, and I and I agree with you, man, that I appreciated it more on a second and third watch, because like I said, the first time I watched the movie, and then I read a review that was like, yeah, turning Paul into the the bad guy, I was like, the fuck that movie did? It did not turn him into a bad guy at all. We were rooting for him the whole time, but yeah, I think just, that the score and the he, music. Yeah, sorry really presents that point of this foreboding like okay but the bad shit is about to happen he he yeah. he's achieved all of like the good goals or whatever and if i remember the book correctly a lot of what it is is what he's what he's foreseeing for the future is basically i can do what's good for me and mine or i can do what's better for the universe at large and he chooses me and mine yeah, like because i'm the going to thing, save the, the people could close do. to me because the only thing he could do at that point would be to off himself. Like once the Fremen are into him, he's sort of, he's kind of stuck. Like yeah. at that point, yeah. you know? <clears throat> um, yeah. Well, well, like for me, there was a couple spots where I was emotional. Uh, maybe not sad, not even sad per se, but like when he finally stands up at the council, Paul finally stands up at the council of the Fremen and he's like, no, he finally steps into what he's supposed to be. It's very yeah. quick in the movie and it's jarring because he's like, no, I don't want this power. I don't want this. I just want to fight. I just want to fight. I don't want to lead. And all of a sudden he's like, yeah, no, I, I lead now. And if you challenge me, uh, I'm yeah. going to reveal all the dark shit about your 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 past and make you feel bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, is that, that is, part, I guess that's his bad guy scene. A little bit, but not <laughs> yeah. really. We we're, we're taking this movie from the view of someone who knows the lore. If you right. don't know the lore about Paul Atreides, he's the good guy through and through till the end of the movie. We That's know a great the question. golden. I don't know. I should ask my wife because she hasn't read the book, and I wonder if she's like. I wonder if she took Paul. I'm just saying. Did you take Paul as a bad guy? <laughs> no, she's shaking her head. No. 
No, there's one it, example. I mean, it's we, anecdotal, but it doesn't I think prove a lot, anything. <laughs> I think a lot of it is the fact that we know what's coming. We know the golden path. We know that it, it annihilates right. three quarters yeah. of the universe for his gain and to keep his so-called view of keeping everyone safe. Mm-hmm. And we know that's coming, so we're tainted by that. And yeah. if you're not a person, if you're a guy just going to see the movie Dune, you're like, yeah, he's a good guy. He's leading all these sand people to their victory. Whatever In other that words, means. you're challenging the notion from Brian and Matthew that they felt that way from the movie. You're suggesting that they have caught that that they they sort of have like a caught. What am I looking for? Confirmation this, bias because they do know what happens. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna Hear that how bitches, you see the movie. take that boys. Uh, oh, Scott says you liars. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. Oh, bunch of lying ass motherfuckers. <laughs> because I think it's a and, valid and, it's a valid proposition. Like, if you, how if do we you separate watch ourselves movie, from our knowledge? It's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard because we do know a great deal about the this this universe that this this book has created. Although Matt's if never you, read the second book, and I haven't finished it, so I haven't finished it either. <laughs> but I do know what happens in it because right. you know it's just what you know. I know that Duke Leto or Leto the second is not a good dude, uh, and um, <laughs> you know he lives for thousands of years. But the part. There, there are some emotional parts. They do their best to try. Paul is constantly seeing visions of Cheney being like, I don't know, suffering from radiation sickness, like withering <laughs> away. And he's seeing that oh, all the time. Right. I forgot about that moment. Yeah. Of her so, burned so, face. Holy shit. Yeah. Man. She's right. like kind of desiccated, like drying up like they stole her water or something like that. <laughs> or but, burned. Or burned. <laughs> They're in the water. middle of sucking her juice out for yeah. the, for the water pit. Like, oh shit! Yeah. She's just taking a nap. We thought you were dead, Cheney. <laughs> Put that juice Suck. back in. Put that juice back in. <laughs> Sorry, Mohadeen. We didn't mean to kill your wife. We just wanted water. Uh, but <laughs> there, I I would say that there's that those emotional scenes, and I like when he finally steps into his. All right, I'm going to lead. I'm I'll the be voice at very of the outer world quickly. Shit. Yeah. And he's mad. He's like aggressive about it. And I love that. I was like, let's go. Yeah. Even though I know what's coming, it's cool yeah. to see him finally <laughs> finally realize that he can't just be a warrior for the Fremen. He's, he's too important. He knows too much. And with the water of life, when he imbibes yeah. the water yeah. of life, he can yeah. see all these future paths and which one's the best for him and whatever he feels is necessary. It changes him overnight. I mean, obviously in the books, it's more time. It's, it's not yeah. a week. Yeah. You know, from the, the from prescience the destruction. becomes a real problem for him. Hence, the whole blindness thing, and I won't get into spoiler territory. Yeah. But yeah, the prescience becomes a uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Um. So yeah, I, I to to your point, Matt, the attack on the city. First of all, the sandworms, the the the, the three sandworms coming across oh. the screen, banging through the as the, is that Arakeen city they attack. Boy, oh that, boys, that yeah. is insanely cool. Dude, that's, that's what I mean. Like, it's I'm, one of the I'm marveling at the spectacle of that. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's fucking awesome. It's one of the only moments, like honestly, that I can think of where I watched a scene from the movie and I was like, that's pretty much what I was imagining from the book. That's like, like yeah. on screen. Awesome. I was just like, fuck. It it nailed it. It looked yeah. that the explode from the moment of the big explosion. The to the actual attack of the worms and the Fremen riding in and and the sounds. And I love that they go inside the Emperor and the, the royal chambers and they hear it from the outside. Absolutely. Hearing all of the clatter and the screaming and the bashing. <laughs> like, and I was like, you, dude. <laughs> they are fucking coming for you. And I was like, it just sounded, it's it was perfect. They did that stuff so fucking well. And also, I want to, I have got to jack off about this one fucking scene because it is so fucking cool. That moment when they finally blow open the doors of like the emperor's place and the Sardaukar are all there with their swords yeah. ready, ready for it. And they start, you know, and all this like, it's like smoky and you can't mm-hmm. really see beyond it. But the Sardaukar kind of start marching into the smoke and the, the whole line of Sardaukar disappears into the smoke it is sta- and it stays there for a beat and you hear nothing. And then the figures of the Fremen just start emerging from yeah, the smoke awesome. and coming out. And I was like, that's fucking sick. Yeah, that was <laughs> fucking awesome. Fucking so good. That's, that's again, that's Villeneuve's absolute gift is that type of visual storytelling. Um, yeah. I, I'm with you. When they're in there and you, that that's the, I didn't feel the impending sense of dread outside of academically knowing what happens. I felt the, 
the fear that they, I was sort of imagining the fear they felt in the moment as they hear the yeah. rumbling outside and, and as they kind of roll in and you're like, Oh boy, <laughs> you fucked. are fucked. Um, <laughs> It's funny. One of the things that happens to one of the ha one of the things that happened in the book is that Aaliyah actually kills the Baron, and I believe yeah. she kills him off camera. And I believe she says, "I dispatched our grandfather," or whatever she says, "our our our whatever." However, she with said. a gum jabbar, yeah. And um, and and Frank says, "Well, that's because you don't get the chance to. You don't always get the chance for that fun resolution. That's life." Like, and he was happy that the Baron died off screen. But um, <laughs> his brutal death in the movie is quite intense. And, uh, yeah. and I don't mind that change either, to be honest with you. If Ali is not in the movie and you want Paul to be the one to jam a Chris knife into his neck and watch him die, that is yeah. really hardcore shit, but also <laughs> kind of awesome. Um, yeah, it's satisfying yeah, as well. I really, I really do like that moment. Um, and when he, after, with the, with the Baron's blood all over him, and as he approaches the uh, the Sardaukar who kind of level their blades on him, and then don't they just kind of stand aside? Yeah, <laughs> they just stand there. Yeah, they don't yeah. do shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Uh, no, well, I'm not fighting all these guys. There's too many. Mm. There's too many. <laughs> and I but do no. think you know we haven't really talked about him specifically, but Timothy uh, Chalamet, I do think his performance is really good in this, especially in the sense of him going from being kind of tentative about everything or unsure about everything to embodying the most like sure focused Paul of like, yeah, we're, we're doing it. We are pushing forward. He has um, very like, believable confidence towards the end. Yes, of the movie. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I'm his, not the way he commands the room at the end. Yeah. There's only one performance that's kind of <laughs> shitty. <laughs> Otherwise, they're all pretty fucking good. I need I, more spice. Explore I, I was space. waiting for it. I was waiting <laughs> the for it. elephant in the room. Yeah. The, the, to this point. the only, the only, the only performance that I was like, okay, was that one. I think everyone. There is no problem with any of these performances. I'm not particularly keen on Cheney's writing, but the woman who plays Cheney is just fine. You yeah. know, there's yeah. there's nothing, I don't think there's any flubs there. I mean, she's a very competent actress. I feel like um, they I'm, I'm just like crazy about her that, writing. That, the casting on Walken of like getting a name, you know, yeah. a name of a guy of a certain age with, with the, very recognizable, and I think that they just, it was just so the wrong choice. I think it's choice. a miss. Yeah, I think it's a miss <laughs> yeah. because I think I think he's too old. It's to not even Walken's great. fault either. It's I not Walken's it's, fault. It's he's just too like old. He did a bad, I mean, he did a bad job in that <laughs> it, it, it wasn't a very well-written character, and it was, it just, it, it just fell flat. Well, but you, you're just putting I, the wrong guy in that position. Isn't the right. Emperor only like 40? He looks 40. Because of the spice melange's effect on his health, so okay. he should look a lot younger. Uh, none of the movies get this right, I don't think. He is supposed to look a little bit older, you know. Um, and the and I don't know, just like that sort of backhanded, like your fucking mother sucks. Like I don't like the backhand. <laughs> like I was like, that's a bad line. It's petty. It's like, petty. He's he's the emperor. He's not supposed to be kind exactly. of petty like that. He's and he's walking around in a hospital smock, like he's lost, <laughs> fun, lost, got lost on the way to the shitter. <laughs> You know, like it's just. I've sad. escaped the sanitarium. They didn't show yeah, the part where he turned around and it's open in the back. You know, you can see his little mums hanging out, his little pasty <laughs> ass. He's pushing on IV, fucking. Nah, but it, it's it, it's not. It's I, I think it's a mistake. But um, but I, I love I, Chris Walken. I've always loved Chris Walken. I, I just think he's a he's yeah. eighty. I don't I don't think he should play this role at eighty. That's all. It's not nothing, nothing. I didn't. It didn't enough. like. It didn't take me out of the movie. It's they not seem like to it, like, limit him, right? Fucked me over. Wait, the limited walking. I think they limited. Oh, dude, him. Yeah. he had like seven minutes of screen time in a three-hour movie. Right. Yeah. At That's most, why I'm yeah. saying I think that they just got a name. You know, they got a yeah. big name with a recognizable face to be like, he's the fucking emperor of the known universe. Mm, exactly. And <laughs> you respect walking, but they didn't give him a lot of screen time, and I think it's because they probably knew. I mean, think about it, in this three-hour movie, they probably filmed a lot of stuff that didn't. I'm looking forward to extended cuts. Let's be real. Yes. yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. I bet Walken has yeah. a lot of stuff that hit that hit the cutting room floor because Villeneuve probably recognized, realized after a certain point, maybe this wasn't. Yeah. Maybe I should question my casting director a little. I already bit more. signed the contracts. I can't fire him now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. They Eric but, um, Stoltz's ass from Back to the Future, and like, no, we're filming <laughs> right? the whole fucking thing again. No. Nope. <laughs> Look, and there's a name I didn't expect to hear today, Eric Stoltz. Holy shit. This one. <laughs> That's fun. still better than uh you know jodorowsky's dune emperor choice which was salvador dali <laughs> yeah <laughs> which would have been not great bonkers <laughs> not great yes not, i'm not awesome. sure uh, uh you know i i guess i i guess i can say this about the filmmakers um villeneuve seems to seems to care m- most about the source material compared to his his predecessors so i guess i'll yeah. give him that um, I just, it did really annoy me that everyone just assumed that he was right about this Frank Herbert thing and just kept repeating it ad nauseum. And and I was like, you guys, you just took what this guy said and ran with it and you posted it and you replied to it and you liked it and you reposted it. And, and Ah, the internet. I dare you to find <laughs> the point where Frank says, I was really upset with the portrayal of uh, how people took it. it. You won't find it. And if you do, I'm wrong and I'll admit it, but. I take the man's word for it, even though uh, R.I.P. Frank Herbert. But um, no, nah, man, it's uh, like I said. I think we're kind of wrapping up here, and uh, and and I know there's a, probably a lot, a lot here. There's a lot, there's a lot of bitching I left off of this because I think I did enough. <laughs> you know, I'm just looking at my uh, the Mahdi must be Fremen, Arrakis must be freed by its own people. Paul is not here to lead; he's here to fight beside you and. Can, it's can no we miracle. Talk about- she was trained to do it. And uh, there's a lot of this dialogue in the world. Dean goes on for the- another seven it, full it, minutes. It, He's like, I'm not going to get into it. I'm, but, not, uh- I'm, I'm just brushing past my notes. You know? <laughs> so that's all. I'm not going to fucking be annoying. You know, we, we're kind of on a good upturn here. And uh, yeah, that's all. So anyway. Did, um, did you hold on? Right. Oh, did you guys. Uh- did you guys like the when he finally uses the voice on the Reverend Mother? I oh, the, was it was awesome at the end. What when is he, he saying yeah. again? He just goes silence, and she just fu- gets like <laughs> like like wired straight up. Yeah. Like so there's she did two to him things earlier. that I really like in this adaptation, uh, both one and two versus Lynch. Now one of them is something that can't really be done anything about because it was the '80s. And that's I love the portrayal of the personal shields in awesome. in this newest adaptation. I thought that they looked fucking. You don't sick. like the eight and, graphics of Lynch's. Film. No, you could have left that shields. out. If you're gonna if you're gonna do if you're gonna do fucking weirding Some modules, te- you can change the tech in, like a, in said, other ways as well. Eighties was tough to make that work. Yeah, right. But the other thing is to Scotty's point, the voice I thought was just really well done in 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 almost every permutation. I, I know you mentioned the. Uh, the Fremen Reverend Mother using yes. it to drink, which is no, I, great, I don't but, love that use. I love how it sounds, but how the sound of it, I think, and this this speaks again to production value, right? The the mm-hmm. sound of it, but also to the point that uh, Timothy Chalamet does such a great job. I think uh, displaying Did you say that Chalamet because that's hilarious. <laughs> Old Chalamet, <laughs> ding dong, fucking Timmy boy. <laughs> I can Timmy Shams. <laughs> I'm not gonna. Kid. I'm not gonna even try and redeem it. <laughs> I'll just keep on mispronouncing it. Yeah, who cares? Um, Go ahead. I think that he he portrays such a good confidence, and then that use of the voice is. I thought it was an awesome moment, Scotty. It's a good call. Me yeah. too. Um, I actually like that yeah. moment. I I, I like that moment a lot because I think, especially as a book reader, it's a it's a great visual representation of 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 Mohayim's world sort of collapsing in on itself and that is the Kwisa Chatterach has come too soon we cannot control him and in and, and, and that is visually represented in one single moment so of all of Villeneuve's choices this might be a hidden brilliant one because it's really hard to portray why they've lost control of him but for him to use the voice on her when she used it on him in the first movie is a real big turnaround now yeah I'll wax poetic about the book in relation to that concept just for a second, if I may. The Kwisatz Haderach being born a generation early meant that he was unable to be properly given tutelage by the Bene Gesserit, which is why they were so upset with them. Because Paul grew up, until Paul is like a teenager, is the first time he sees Mohayim. 
Now, for the proper Kwisatz Haderach to be groomed correctly, they need to be in the presence of them as a baby. So they can be properly controlled. And that's why the Ben and Jezreel were so pissed off. Um, So that's that, right? They're like, this is wrong. You fucked us up. Now we have to make (laughs) backup plans and Fade's got to plow Fenring's wife. But anyway, um, (laughs) so that moment where he's just boom and that forcibly she falls into that crowd of people, I think is really awesome. I do think that that's awesome. I like that a lot um, because I think it's a, a perfect moment of all of this shit where they storm the fucking Arakeen city and they kill everybody. That really matters, but it's warfare where it should could happen. But when you stand there and you shout down the head of the Bene Gesserit with the voice that's the moment where everyone should shit their pants in the fucking throne room. They should go, we're <laughs> fucked. Like that's because that, that's how important that moment is. And I'm really glad you brought up Scott because I kind of forgot about it and it is important. So yeah, yeah. I think that's a great choice by Villeneuve to have him shout her down. And those people are yeah. shitting themselves without even realizing the full scope of what a thousand you, we were talking about earlier with the, the combination of Mentat, Bene Gesserit, Kuzach Haderach, fucking leader of the Fremen, Yep. Duke of House the Trady and Emperor Listan of the Universe. Don't forget, like, Stilgar gets so mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> Listan al <laughs> um, Just all of those things combined. Like, he has just become the most powerful entity in the universe. And I think that they're like, that That moment is, like you're like you're saying, it's the visual representation of that. Um, and there, there are the a couple of things. chains are off. That, right. Like, there are things that he does right that show, you know, you mentioned at the very beginning of the movie that we were not able to see because we were ushered into the wrong fucking movie theater. Um, oh, is... it's, I know. Um, <laughs> when, when they, when they absorb the water from the Sardaukar and then they just put the thumper and erase the evidence with a worm, it's such a good visual no representation words. of yeah. what the Fremen are like. And there's a bunch of beats along the path of this movie that do visually show a lot of cool stuff. And maybe it behooves us to know a lot about the books and be able to glean that stuff. But I, I do think that that at the end of the movie is a really good show of of his ultimate power and everybody in the room being like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Hell yeah. Um, one other quote. Um, Charismatic leader Bryant Gumbel interview 82 uh, rejected sequel oh oh yeah this is um oh i guess i've already made that point i'm not going to bring that shit back up again i'll let that rest um i forgot to play one sound clip but it doesn't really matter the point's been made so yeah man i um i guess if i want to start wrapping up my thoughts on this um and then we'll hear from a couple listeners i'm gonna high level really skim some of this shit but um they're great comments though we have, they are I have no to say i, I said they're that fantastic the, comments i, I said yeah, that I, yeah, yeah i was jump. reading some but um, I will say this. I am very happy that, that Villeneuve did Dune, and I'm happy that Dune exists, and I'll see the next one, too, and I'll see the first one again, and I'll see the second one again, and I'll see the third one a couple times, too, I bet. It's, mm-hmm. it's good for science fiction. It's good for the fucking movie industry. The reason people are so excited about this and why I don't want to play spoiler to them is because I want you all to be excited for Dune. I think that's very awesome. Yeah, it's really nice to see a massive science fiction movie not named Star Wars. It's yes. great. <laughs> yeah, keep it 100%. coming. <laughs> keep doing it. I'm still gonna pay for it. I'm still gonna take you to task when you say or make dumb choices. Not that you care, but that's my job. If I'm gonna talk about a movie for two and a half hours, I'm not gonna suck its cock the whole time, unless <laughs> it's a movie I really like. Then I probably will. So ignore me. But my point is this. <laughs> This is good for film, and it's good for science fiction. And, uh, and I think it's awesome that people are excited about this. I think it's awesome that they're talking about it. I think it's awesome that it's making money. I think it's great that these people are getting fucking paid. And, uh, you know, my gripes aside, it's successful, and that's good. I don't wish failure on Villeneuve or Dune. I want all of these people to be successful as a result of taking something like Frank Herbert's Dune, and yes, getting paid to do it, lots of money, all of them, but taking something... <laughs> that is regarded as one of the best science fiction books of all time with good reason in making it a movie and making it a trilogy, really. Um, 
So hats off to Villeneuve. I know I started by us being in a fight, but I like you. I think you're great. I think you're a great filmmaker, and I want to keep watching your fucking movies. And I really want people to make more science fiction movies not named Star Wars and not made by fucking Disney. That's, yeah. that's the major triumph of this fucking movie. And uh, one of the things I love about it. And I wasn't super high on movie one. And I saw it again after being removed from it emotionally for a while. And I liked it a lot more. Maybe the same will happen with the second movie as well. And, uh, and I know that I bring my own shit to it. So that's kind of how I feel about this shit at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> that's my final thoughts about Dune. What about you guys? Yeah, I mean, for me, like I've been saying, you know, <clears throat> this movie overall, on the whole, works for me on pretty much every level. Like it's got it's got its issues, and you know, and like I was saying earlier, like it didn't quite connect with me emotionally as much on the first time, and and still maybe could could be better in that department, I guess. Um, but on the whole, I think this movie captures. And brings to the forefront um, the elements of the story that are probably the most important. I think it does a good job of distilling the book into its most crucial and distinctive elements. Um, the stuff that really makes Dune, Dune. Um, it really showing Fremen culture, really getting into mission art, the Missionary Protectiva and, and the idea of there being a seed in a culture that can be manipulated and like just those ideas alone are so interesting and we get into them and we we at least look at them and 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 you know we we see the effects of these things um and then like what like what we've been saying the visual side of it the visual spectacle of it all is just a total success in yep. in every way i think i think it just the design i mean even the little fucking the design of the little straws that they 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 use to suck air when they're underground before they pop up like <laughs> fremen to go stab guys even those little fucking things i was like what a cool design that just looks fucking cool like yeah. everything like all of it was so so well done um, and then I think the new choice, some of the newer choices in, as far as how to wrap up the story and, you know, even like Paul killing the Baron and those, those choices like that, I think work, I think are really solid. Um, it, it was definitely very satisfying, a very satisfying ending to me. Um, they're, uh, and I, I, I don't know, we didn't really say this, but they are definitely for anybody who didn't know they were going to make a part three. I think by the end of part two, you're like, where's the part three going to start? Because that's how you feel by the end of it, because it's just like, it's coming. It feels like it anyways. Um, and, and the first yeah, book dude, ends rather ignominiously. <laughs> it just like, totally. Ends, yeah. Like, it oh, just fuck. stops <laughs> on purpose, on purpose again. Yeah. But um, but yeah, no man. At the end of the day, Dune Part Two I think is a damn fine movie. I think Denis Villeneuve is a excellent filmmaker. Um, I I pretty much am happy with the entire cast. Mm. You know, Beast Rabon we joked about a little bit as far as you know, a little bit one note, a little bit dumb. But I th I still even think but uh, Batista did good with what he was given. He's um, great in twenty forty nine. In, in, yeah, in he's great in that. moments. Yeah. Oh, I mean, don't get it twisted. Batista's yeah. a good actor. Yeah. He right? is I good think too. that to Matt's point, it's what he was given, you know? Yeah. I, I, yeah. But um the my you know, honestly, my only major disappointment that I didn't talk about, like I just gotta say this at the end here. Drove all the way to Vancouver, Washington to go to an AMC theater to get the goddamn worm <laughs> bucket, and they were fucking out of them. They were fucking yep. out. I didn't Brian's get my bucket. You. Brian's got that shit. Oh. How, many, how many times have you had sex with that thing yet, Brian, huh? <laughs> he, he oh, ain't come on. Listen, he ain't touching I've had it for sides. a couple of weeks now. <laughs> Fuck you, Dean. <laughs> I'm all up in this shit. <laughs> <laughs> the tigla. <sighs> I wanted one, and they didn't have me there, so. Um, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not gonna lie. I did not get this. This was a gift. Um, oh, you'll notice cool. that it does not have a bucket attached to it. Uh, I <laughs> had uh, an employee of mine who knew that I was a big fan of Dune went to see the movie, and she got a she got a bucket that was broken. So they gave them a second, her and her uh, boyfriend, a second one, and so she oh, saved nice. the top of the first one to give to me at work, which was a very sweet <laughs> gesture. Awesome, nice. Shai Halud. Yeah, beautiful. Um, any other and closing I thoughts? It many, many times. <laughs> Hell yeah! So thanks. <laughs> Uh, 
one last thing about this movie. I thoroughly enjoy when a movie such as Dune, a science fiction movie, a revered one, does well in theaters because there's yeah. kids out there today that are watching that and they're 12 years old, 13 years old, and they're going to fucking del- dive deep into sci-fi. They're going to look for this book. They're going to look for the other Dune books and they're going to branch out into something that they normally wouldn't see, they wouldn't get into. And down the road, some of those people are going to be directors and they're going to, you know, they're going to make their own science fiction movies down the road and continue this on. And it's a great I think point. there's I nothing think about the kids, you know, who might be inspired yeah. by something like this. Yeah. How, how many movies, you know, when we were kids you, that you saw and you, you, you obsessed over and then you went looking and you found everything out about, about the movie and mm. then you found out the person who made the movie made other movies and you branch out and it's this giant web and before you know it, you're <laughs> enveloped in science fiction and it yeah. becomes part of your everyday life like it has for all of us here. And I, I love the fact that that grows because of movies like this. There are normies out there, people who aren't into this kind of thing, who went and, see, went and sat down to see a movie and maybe it made them think about something a little deeper or made them spark an interest in science fiction. And we can keep going because of it. It, it, it changes the people's direct, you know, direction in their lives and we get more movies because of it. I love that. I love That's that it affects people. That's a great point, people. Scott. And, and, and it's yeah. also, it also mirrors the success of Frank's original novel because... It was a science fiction book that non-science fiction people were reading, which was a hard prospect in the late '60s. Um, so yeah, that's that's a great point. To, to maybe to maybe this will do this. Maybe this will do the same in that respect. Is is awesome. It's How a you, it's Bri? a very cool point to me specifically because, and this is a little bit embarrassing with uh, rewatching it and a million times. But the David Lynch's Dune. When I was a kid, I fucking loved that movie. Me too. And I watched the shit out of it, and it was before I had read the book, and that's what launched me into wanting to know more about Dune and reading all of the books and like getting really into the lore. Because I remember when I first watched that movie, I was in probably like fourth grade or something, and that is a dense ass book (laughs) to 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 drop in the lap of a a ten year old. Doesn't you know, work. Yeah, it doesn't it, work. Right. I don't think. So by the time I was in like seventh, eighth grade, I could start to kind of wrap my head mm-hmm. around the the weightier concepts. And by the way, not entirely, of course, but um, I could <laughs> at least genius. start to wade through the books and understand what was going on. Um, but Scott, the reason that I love that point so much is that like just watching that movie and getting into it, you know, what it was notwithstanding anymore, um, I it made me want to know more and it made me want to get into that universe. And so it kind of make, it gives me hope that this movie franchise, the, the, the reboot here will, uh, will inspire people to go after that source material, which is so great. Mm-hmm. I mean, it gets a little bit weirder later on. Um, but my thoughts on, on Dune two specifically are I weird. This is going to be a weird counterpoint to what I was just saying. I almost wish that I could have seen it fresh, Based without having ever read the book because I think I might have had a much higher opinion on it because I think that in general it's a very good movie I think that they made a lot of um that they he made a lot of decisions that were good you know we've, we talked about a lot of the the missteps but I think that a lot of you know to Matt's point earlier you know focusing in on being like okay if we got to pick one thing what's it going to be we're going to pick the Bene Gesserit and and that plot line to to forward to go forward with, um, mm-hmm. and and I think that was the right choice ultimately. So I I, I kind of wish that I had been able to see it without that like the reservations of being a, a book snob, but ultimately it's a visual spectacle that, like I said, I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna trust my gut on the walking out of the theater feeling, which is I was like that was fucking awesome, yeah. <laughs> And that was just kind of my initial gut. That's what most people did, and then they vomited their thoughts onto Facebook and other places. And I think, (laughs) and 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 then I think it slowly but surely they started to get counterpoints to a lot of that excitement post theater watching. You know, yeah, I think I I think it's a great point, Brian. And 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 like I said, I'm I do like this movie. I'm 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 definitely on I'm on record as saying I like this movie. I think. You know, the, the emotional, the lack of emotional resonance, which I know Matt talked about, I think we've all kind of talked about a little bit. I think if you have a, a little bit more of a well-rounded 
if your character is a little bit more well-rounded and they have better relationships as expressed on screen, it would be easy for us to feel an emotional connection to them as opposed to them becoming personifications of distilled ideology. I think is why it's mm. hard to like... <laughs> it, well said. You know what I yeah. mean? I think that's what makes yeah, it difficult, difficult to sort of like feel a connection to them. But, um, but no, I, I, I think... Um, I think that, like, again, I, I'm, I've told you what I've said. So here's what I want to do, just out of curiosity. I'm, I'm really curious as to how you guys will, will feel if I just say, if you could give it a number one to 10, what do you think you would give it? Hmm. Do you have, whoever knows, speak first. Eight. Brian says eight. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, yeah, thinking the same thing. Eight. Yeah, eight. Uh, eight. That's what I first popped in my head. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'm gonna yeah. give it a seven seven. <laughs> oh, hey, we didn't do Mr. Decimal fucking five. decimal point <laughs> over here. <laughs> I'm gonna give it a seven. I'll give it a seven. I'll give it a seven five. All right. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm gonna round your seven five down to a seven. No, that's mean. <laughs> You gotta round up if it's five. <laughs> no, if I if, I, if I'm forced to round, I will round to seven. But I think I'm somewhere between seven and eight. I'm not quite ready to give it an eight, but I might be. And I think I might give the first movie an eight, actually. But um, and on initial view, I probably would have gave that a seven. So who knows what the future hmm. holds? I, I'm gonna so say I did, I somewhere in that range. It's definitely not a six. Let's be real. But yeah, I'm probably. but I'm not ready to say eight just yet. Um, now if I didn't weigh in on aspects, that particular point. But I like the first movie better too. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I do too. I, and now, but I wasn't sure. Um, but to everyone's point, I think the production is at least a ten out of ten, maybe a nine out of ten. Dude, um, yeah. Just because of like, I do like ED Prime, but watch it again, and I was like, this almost looks like a computer game now, where the the people <laughs> are look so fake. They're just all waving their hand the same yeah. way, like a, like a NCAA football game crowd, all doing the same <laughs> hand motion, and like a fucking playstation game but um <laughs> so it may be a little bit there but no otherwise i think it's it's phenomenal but anyway i think we've said enough about dune um this was a great conversation i appreciate you guys making it happen and um it was great to to have you uh, guest on the show matthew that was really cool yeah, and um back. yeah it was it was fun i hope you guys uh, enjoyed this program and uh, a couple of listeners i will say before we go um <clears throat> So, uh, they're really lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote the fucking Magna Carta over here. They really they, did. They did. I, they did. I, I think, um, <laughs> uh, here's, here's a good one. Ryan says, I think Denis did about as good a job as you could do for a film adaptation of an immensely complex, rich, and detailed world. I didn't live some, love some of the changes, but I can also wrap my head around why the change was made. Um, Aaliyah, for example, was a change I thought made sense. The North versus South Fremen is an example of a change I was less enthusiastic about. Um, I felt a bit like a shortcut in the writing that maybe came at the cost of us getting better understanding of Fremen culture. I agree, Ryan. He continues, even splitting this into two movies leaves a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor and requires some serious condensing, condensing by Villeneuve. All the book stuff aside, the movie looks amazing. Giddy Prime, specifically the infrared with that black center, just Jeff's kiss perfect. I dug Jessica's water of life scene and the impact to her fetus. I love the movie despite some of the differences. Um, during the science fiction film podcast episode of Braveheart, Dean said something along the lines of, appreciate the movie for what it is, then go ahead and read the history, and then uh, you can appreciate that as well. There you go. Um, oh, yeah. So here's uh, Hannibal. Every time somebody said or did something stupid in the movie, it was invented for the movie and totally contrary to the text and spirit of the book. And there was a lot of stupidity for comic relief, narrative convenience to enhance the colonizer indigenous theming. Um, did the writers forget that the Fremen are a migratory people and not native to Dune and that the Fremen judge people on how honorable they are and how well they live in balance with the ecosystem, which is why the Fremen accept Paul. I could not believe that the movie had Cheney say that Paul had never been in charge because he is not a natural born Fremen, as if Fremen would see his virtue, his embrace of their ways and his great ability as a leader and reject him as naive because he is a refugee, not native. That's a really fucking good. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Um, Raban shouts, splutters, and hits. Uh, Silgar's goofy oaf mocked by teenage girls. Um, 
Harkonnen just never think to check the south until the Emperor arrives and does so, etc., etc., etc. The book gives us intensely unified, loyal, honorable, fierce, and faithful Fremen with unfathomable naivety, honor, and inexhaustible drive to perfect every pursuit they apply themselves to. They are unblinking in the face of hard decision and difficult truth. They're absolutely practical, pragmatic, calculating, unhesitatingly take the action that will comport with their virtue, but lack softness and compassion and are far more fierce. That character sets the path of Paul's ascendancy and shows the seeds of his eventual fall. What a great way to describe the Fremen, which is not entirely handled by the movie. <laughs> um, he goes on and on. I highly recommend reading reading Hannibal's stuff. And then let me counterbalance that with Zoe Bali, as mentioned earlier, who states, <clears throat> in adapting the book and given the absolute density of it, Villeneuve has openly talked about the need to jettison certain elements of the book for his adaptation. He's talked about his love for the Spacing Guild, but really felt it necessary to focus on the Bene Gesserit and the idea that religion and fanaticism can corrupt our morality. I think that this is a milestone in blockbuster visual filmmaking. It's incredibly clear that so much thought was given to how the universe is going to be realized. Villeneuve has talked about how difficult it was to shoot. Two characters are having a conversation atop a sand dune and the sun goes down. Bad luck. Come back another day and finish the conversation when the sun's in the right place. His reliance on practical filmmaking rather than using... <clears throat> the volume, which Dune Part 2 cinematographer Greg Fraser developed, is incredible. It's why Arrakis feels more alien than Tatooine. Not only that, but the lens choices were well thought out. Villeneuve talks about his ultimately being a movie about a boy who becomes a leader and is ultimately an intimate story despite the scale of it. So intentionally chooses lenses that will allow close-up shots of Paul. Um, he has a lot to say about that, um, which is cool. So yeah, good stuff. Cool. Yeah, there's a lot of great thoughts on this. I highly, again, I appreciate you guys all for chiming in, but those are just some quick highlights from the listener comment section. And um, yeah, that's it. This is a little bit of a departure from our cowboy block, but um, <laughs> we wanted to talk Dune. Matt wanted to, Matt reached out. He's like, I want to be on Dune. When are you doing it? I said, no problem. Let's do it. Brian was goodly enough to join us. And, uh, and I think we had a great conversation. And uh, I think yeah. we're all pretty high on Dune. And I just want people to remember something. Because we're not saying this movie's a 10 doesn't mean we don't like it. And we need to really strike that narrative from our discourse when it comes to movies. I'm sick of people having a problem with you not loving and sopping up every... I hate that people expect us, ironically, to be yeah. like Stilgars to your movie and just suck everything about it up. And like, At least in Al Gaib is the movie's the greatest movie ever. It's okay for us to <laughs> really like a movie and still have a lot of problems with it. Dude, it, it reminds me to... of the, the Paul McCartney sketch on SNL with Chris Farley, where he's like, "You remember when when you when you sang that song? That was awesome. That was that was awesome. It's, awesome. it's <laughs> like it's 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 more interesting to talk about the stuff that that you know we found to be a little bit controversial. It, it's, or at least it's fun to talk about the stuff that we love, but yeah, thought provoking exactly thought -provoking. stuff that's going to stir conversation. Yeah. Correct. Versus just saying like, "Man, that one scene was." <laughs> That was awesome. that was good, <laughs> right? Exactly. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I just, I just, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of tired of that, and, and, and I'm not trying to preach, and you know, be who you're going to be. I don't give a fuck, but, but it would be cool if we could just have a discussion about movies, and to where I, you know, we could talk about what we don't like about them, and it doesn't have to be an indictment on the filmmaker on the entire movie, and that it sucks, and that we're pieces of shit, and how do we not love it more, and why we're all so wrong. And yeah, maybe we're making points you disagree with or, or you may even consider invalid and I invite your discourse, but it's okay to be like a seven or an eight and still really like a movie. And, yeah. and, and it doesn't have to like hurt your weird little ideological bubble you <laughs> built around yourself regarding this fucking movie. So, but yeah, it's cool. I really like it. We've talked a lot about it. I think we're done. Any Anything else you guys want to say before we go? Uh, no. Other than thank you for having me on, no, thank oh, yeah. you, no. This this was a this was a ton of fun. Thank you guys, and we were pretty good yeah, about not great. stepping on each other. I stepped on people like I do, but um, no, I I appreciate you guys. We're all in different locations, so and, and we're delayed here. So, but um, no, very cool. Yeah, do me a favor, oh, yeah. like like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. Hopefully, we get it to YouTube without any incident. Maybe some of those clips. I'm gonna have to cite those articles, but I don't know. and share. Share it. Let your friends know if you like this stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I just yeah. want to say something weird happened. We covered Outlaw Josie Wills, and it has 2,000 views on YouTube. I don't oh, know. Shit. I don't know how that nice. happened. It just kind of happened because everything else has like 400. 
I don't know why. I don't know what the algorithm is. I don't understand it. I'm trying to figure it the fuck out. Um, the people hope, love Josie. It was wild. Yeah, I'm hoping this. Uh, I'm hoping this gets some uh, some love too. So, um, again, cool movie, amazing soundtrack, ridiculously oh, yeah. good. Um, we probably could have talked more about that, and we didn't. I mean, Matt, thank God, brought it up at the end, but the soundtrack's phenomenal. <laughs> um, so good. But, to the point that every time that we play the the Dune board games that we've been playing. I, I've it's got that the soundtrack background. on yeah, in the yeah, background. Yeah. And, and also, when I, I will a peek behind the curtain. When we first got on here, if all four of us are just doing, it, you know, like every like 15 seconds, one. one of us just goes, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to say, that's that, all we need to go out on. I was going to play that every time it departed from the book, but then I realized that we just have to be on a loop. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say something before we go, Scotty? I was just going to say, we needed to go out on the yell. And you you want to go out on so the yell? Good. All right. Yeah, let's go out on the yell. Love you guys. Peace. <laughs>